Well, the channel says we're live now. Okay. So that's good. So if you actually go to the Brad and Kyle channel, the first thing that pops up, the top thing, is we're live. There's no thumbnail, though, but that's okay. We'll figure that out later. <laughs> um, we have three viewers. Hey, don't go anywhere. We're figuring this out. Let me uh, post something on Facebook. Oh, no. that's the. I, I sleep with the link to the Google Hangouts. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> that would have that been no good. Don't uh, don't come in here. <laughs> okay. Copy. And I are live. Come ask Cameron some questions with me. So I'm I'm pretty horrible at uh, social media. Are you good at it or not? I don't know. I'm horrible at it in the sense to where like I always make typos and Kyle gets like super mad at me. And he goes, you have typo here, you got typo here. I'm like, I don't care about the dang typos. All right, we'll be right back. All right. See here, let's share this post. All right. How's the raw chest? <laughs> well, I think we sorted out most of our uh problems and i'm sure more will arise as time goes on uh oh baccarat i read that as broadcast i have enough coffee today <laughs> uh, i don't think i've ever lost at baccarat so that's good I got your uh I got a notification saying you shared the post. Yep. Okay, so I take it this chat that we see is not the chat that they're in. So we're gonna have to have this thing out. All right. No Kyle today. Wait, are you a baccarat guy, Cameron? <laughs> yeah. Kind <Really>? of. <laughs> yeah, it's easy. It's like 50-50. <laughs> it's the easiest game to play. <laughs> Just put your money on the table. Is it actually 50-50? Um, pretty close, actually. Okay, so I'm going to have to figure out a way to take this. So when I take when I'm on the actual YouTube screen and I want to like look at the chat, if I make it smaller, it just goes to the camera screen, not the chat. Um, I have so maybe this is going to be like kind of difficult. All right. How many people we got watching? Like 15. You got 15? Yeah. 16. All right, cool. Well, let's get going. Wait, so you said, so back right, 50-50. It's actually 50-50? Uh, no, the, the, you can bet on the tie, but it's... It's as close as 50-50 as anything, really. Sweet. Have you done pretty good at it? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Hey, Flanagan. Flanagan's a Baccarat guy. I remember that from Reno. That's why he brought it up, because we played with him in Reno, and we had, like, this sick run. Okay. Yeah. I remember the sick run. I walked him back to his uh, his hotel after the sick run. <laughs> he was super excited. Yeah, everyone on the table made money. I made like a hundred bucks. Everyone else made like five hundred because I'm pretty conservative gambler. Gambler. <laughs> I like gambling. I just don't gamble much. 
Yeah, me neither, man. It's like, well, when you spend when you spend two weeks in Reno, <laughs> it's like, okay, what is there to do other than gamble? So if you if you have that mentality, it's like betting yeah. twenty dollar, three dollar hands. It just adds up. I can't even bet twenty dollar hand when even when I have money. <laughs> I'm like, that's too many red chips on the table. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So if you're in the if you're in the chat. Uh, I don't know. Just ask questions and interact with us. I'll do my best. So I'm trying to like talk to Cameron and hang out with Cameron and then try and look at the the chat, but the chat has the screen up playing and separating up on my phone. But so I'll do uh I'll do my best. All right, let's uh let's get into it. So how's the uh how's bowling going, man? Is it going all right? Uh yeah, I mean just uh trying to stay busy. Uh my my national tour stuff isn't doing that great, but pretty much everything else I attempt has been doing pretty well. When you say staying busy, what does that entail? What do you do to stay busy? Uh, like uh, practice schedule and just keeping my focus on like uh, the top level of the game. Um, like right now, uh, there's a quite a bit of time between the next uh, tour stop for me, so I'm trying to kind of keep focused on making sure I go in and practice and take care of my business and make sure everything's still in line and keep my game in a top shape. When you, when you say keep your focus, do you find it if when there's a lot of time off that when you go practice that even though you're practicing since the focus, like it's easy to lose that focus. And then even though you're practicing, you're not really getting any better. So you spend a lot of time practicing, but it's not in like a really high focused, intense way. So when you actually get out to whatever you're practicing for, you're not as sharp as you want to be because there's just so much time in the middle. Yeah. It, yeah. It, I think we've talked about this a little bit too. And it's kind of like, uh, uh, like the environment on tour is, is so different than what we bowl on locally at the local level, even though the competition is really good at the local level too, it's just different on tour. It's just yeah. another level. Yeah. And so it's so hard to practice that and to like, since we have so much time off, it's hard to try to maintain that level of uh, intensity. So like, yeah, when I get home and practice, like just yesterday I was practicing for an hour. I'm like, huh, I feel pretty good. But like, how do I, how do I know that I'm, I'm pretty yeah, good? Definitely. Like I won't have a measure. I won't have a measuring stick for another few weeks at least. So, um, it's it's kind of hard to trying to keep. Uh, I don't know. Keep I know. focused. I guess. <laughs> I can remember when I was in college. I was doing some homework with my buddy Dan Lemish, who was on the bowling team with me, and he was like, I think he asked me like we were we were looking up World Series scores, and I think I mentioned to him one time. I was like, I can do that. You know, I can go 250 over on a you know, fairly difficult pattern. Like I've done it in college, you know, I can do that. Yeah. And I had like really no idea what it actually entailed to go 250 over on tour. You know, it's one thing to go like, you know, average 230 in a college tournament or a local tournament or whatever, but the, the tour is so different. And I've had people ask me like, do you think so-and-so uh, can compete on tour? I'll give an example, like a guy around town, Joe Bush, he's a good bowler. But it, like when someone's like, they watch him bowl league, they average 240. He's obviously a really good bowler. And they ask, like, well, why can't he compete on tour? And I'm like, well, it's not like he can't. He's definitely got the ability to do so. But on tour, like, the one thing that's the hardest is the transition. Mm -hmm. And if you, don't, if you don't see that transition on tour, if you don't get out there and experience it for yourself, you're blindsided because it's so intense. Yeah. Going from pair to pair is so so different, and what and who you bowl with matters, and the surface of their bowling balls, and all these variables that don't necessarily matter when you're just competing in league. Yeah, and uh, also just the rev rate too, because like um, we we bowl on tour, and there's just like locally, like we're the we're the big to like rev rate guys. Like we we kind of yeah, determine exactly. how, how, where the lanes go. And we get on tour and we're the fish basically I know. <laughs> so uh like that and that's what i tell people too it's like they, they ask me you know what's the biggest difference between tour and local stuff or like i'm like yeah it's i mean i i've gotten some big scores on these harder patterns but then i go on tour and i can't do anything because I, I i can't keep up with the move or i just don't see it or i just don't have the game for it and it's just so different like it's just quicker it's intense it's yes you know, do it in the middle of a block you know, at the top level is a little bit different than doing it in the middle of a block, you know, at a local tournament that like you're a little bit more, you're squeezing a little bit more. You want to make a better shot. It's just, 
it's a it's, whole yeah, yeah, different mindset. <laughs> way more cutthroat, it feels like. You don't have to necessarily think that it's more cutthroat, and it's actually probably a good thing if you just go into it as if it's a normal, just a normal event. But cutthroat meaning like your mistakes are so limited. So I was I was doing a lesson last night actually to a lady that's uh, pretty much just getting started. She's just learning how to hook the ball essentially, and I was I showed her an arrow on pad. I said, "Have you ever seen one of these?" And she, <laughs> And I was like, this is probably the most important thing in bowling once you reach to a certain level. Like, why? And I was like, because when you when you try and bowl on tour, if you bowl against guys on tour, the physical thing, the things we're learning right now really don't matter because everyone's in, you know, everyone's great at it. They all have great physical games and they're all the best in their little local areas. They're all, you know, it's all the cream of the crop. So the, the physical games like the part of like it doesn't get spoke about much. What does get spoke about much is ball motion pretty much. And that's the most important thing. If your ball's not doing the correct thing, then you're going to lose. I don't yeah. care how good you are. If your ball is not reading the lane correctly, you will be a hit or two behind every single game because yeah. the bowlers that you're competing against have great physical games and they know what to look for. And some of them might not bowl very good, but some of them will. And so every time you bowl, there's – going to be three four five six maybe ten guys that whack them that make mm -hmm. them look stupid and it's hard to beat that like if you don't have the exact thing that you need it becomes extremely difficult yeah and that's a good point too is uh what you said about that one or two hit a game like um that's that's the difference right there is um the guys who whack them who do really well they they have the great physical game they see the ball motion and they they trust what they're doing is correct and they know what they're doing is correct. So they can go out there and make, make the shots and that, that extra confidence in their game will get them that extra hit a game. And you and I have missed cuts and caches by so little pins where you're just like, man, if I just had that one extra hit a game, I'd be in the middle of the race instead of on, you know, squeezing the 10th frame or whatever. Like, Oh, exactly. It, it's, it's just so that, that they just like have it. Like, you know, like, um, like we, we get it every now and then where we'll have a tournament where we feel like, man, we can't miss all the moves are correct. Blah, we, blah, have blah. It, we have it locally. We definitely have it locally. Oh yeah. And it's just, it's so hard to translate that onto the, the bigger stage. And that's what makes, that's what's, that's the separation between the, the true world-class pros and like us. And it's, it's crazy. Like, know, it's, so, can, it's so hard to explain and point out, but it's there. I can remember last year, the world series, they were easy. The scores were really high. And the first, like, maybe two days, um, you, were, you weren't bowling very good. I think you were fresher. We were all fresh. I think everyone in the field was fresh. <laughs> the they were making cuts. Because you had yeah. to have, there was, what, 190 bowlers, and they took 16, I think it was. And yeah. in order to do that, you had to average, like, 245. And it's just, like, just draining, just ridiculous. And so the first couple of days didn't go very well. And I think the third day or the fourth day or something, you were – in second or third at some point like you were bowling really well and then you ended up missing by a couple pins is that correct uh i don't know it sounds like me so sure <laughs> i think i remember talking to you day one or day two and you were pretty frustrated about your game and then the next day i saw a leaderboard after like four games or something and i saw you were in like second i'm like oh nice you figured something out and then at the end of the day i think you missed by like 10 pins and i was like wow because it's so it's so extreme. You go from being frustrated because you feel like you have to be perfect and you're not being perfect. And so, you know, you're going through all these things in your mind. Okay, how am I going to do this? How am I going to average 245 on this pattern? Like, yeah. I mean, they're easy, but they're ain't, they ain't that easy. And so you're going through all these things, and then you finally get to a point where you're, you're having some success for four or five games, and you're in second, which is a hard task to do, and then it ends up poorly. And it's just like it's so hard to be in a good mentality when stuff like that happens. Yeah, and uh, that's another good point too. Is uh, you talked about being high scoring, and that that's part of the mental frustration is going into like a block, like say the World Series, and you bowl like the first day, and you see how high scores are. So you go into the rest of the week thinking, "Man, I got to bowl out of my mind to just cut check or make cat or even be close." And so now, once you miss the, f you miss like three or four times a game. The first two games, you're like, "Well, I'm out of it. Like, what am I supposed to do?" Like, I know. <laughs> and you can't help it either. Like, it's subconscious. Like, it just comes in your mind. Like, you shoot a two ten, you see I everyone mean, shooting two seventies. You know, 10, 15 people shot two seventy. So like, you're, uh, you're sixty back, and you're sixty back of guys that have great ball motion from the get go. 
though. So they're probably not going to like fall off. They're great bowlers. So they're probably not going to fall off too much. So you're already 60 back to great bowlers when they yeah. have a better ball reaction than you. It's extremely, extremely difficult mentally. Yeah. Like, uh, I think one of the patterns, it might have been Cheetah this, this last year. I crossed with Jesper and I shot like eight. 15 the last three games of one of the five game blots and i was like super proud of myself i was like holy shit like I, i'm sorry i'm like oh my god i bowled really well <laughs> and then i'm like i'm still lost 20 pins to jesper i'm like sweet <laughs> like, <laughs> simonelli simonelli is kind of like there's just guys out on tour that are just so dynamite that even when you have it they they have like this thing simonelli is one of those guys or it's like you let yeah. butcher butcher is one of those guys by the way butcher is insane man did you bowl yeah, the regionals no. this past weekend? No, but I've bowled plenty of regionals against him. <laughs> he just dominates the West, man. Yeah. What is that? We have a running joke up here where uh, any regional that Jacob bowls, if you finish second, you actually won. <laughs> well, we finished second this past weekend. Yeah, so you actually won the actual regional. <laughs> <laughs> they, they should give a trophy for second place. Like, hey. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, that guy is unreal, man. I don't know. I don't know what to think of it. It's just so sick. Something about his game, and it's not even like something you can teach. It's like, well, what, like, what, what can I even pull away from that that I could like, you know, share with people? Or it's so unique and so different, and it works so well that it's. I don't know. It's just crazy. Well, uh, the thing you pull away from that is that he has this thing that works, and he's worked really hard to master that and make that his thing. And he knows he's good at it. So he knows when he sees yes. it, he's going to run it over. Yeah. I think, I think you talk about taking something away from that. And that, that's something I try to teach to people is, uh, you know, what, what do you do that makes you your own bowler? Like, what can we work on to, you know, bring that up and bring what you like to do and bring what you're really good at. And let's use that because not everyone does the same thing. Good. And so like, yeah, I, I, I try to find what I do well and do that. And Jacob does that really well. You know that's that's interesting. When I when I grew up bowling, I was I bowled in a 16 lane center. It was wood lanes with a guardian overlay. When I practiced, I practiced every single day after school, and I I would bowl on the leftover from the league before, and they were wood, so they were really really dry. And every day I'd go in and I would uh, I would essentially have to find the oil on the lane. So after you know a year or so, I developed like this really like soft release because I couldn't hit it or else it would hook right. too. Much. So g growing up through youth, I was always better at playing in than everyone because I had to every single day I practice. I had to like learn how to get off my hand nice and easy and let it get down the lane. And I was always familiar with playing left to fourth arrow. And then I moved to St. Louis and for college and it was like totally the opposite. There was a puddle of oil in the middle of the lane and it's amazing <laughs> how much my game changed. And I, I deviated from what I always did very well, which was playing in, being soft um, and now I had to learn how to like get the ball into a roll and it was like totally different. And it, it's kind of weird that, I don't know where you live or, you know, w w at one point in time I was good at one thing. And then before I knew it, I was no longer good at that original thing I was good at, <laughs> which isn't good. You know, it's not good. Yeah. At all. But yeah. when you, that happens. Like if, if you're forced to do different things on different lane patterns, your game molds to it. Yeah. So. But yeah, Butcher, man, it, I was telling a, I was telling a, a lady, the lady I was coaching last night, or no, I wasn't lady. I was, co I was coaching a guy who's a lefty, and he has a high backswing, and I had to tell him, or I wanted to tell him that you don't need a high backswing to generate power or speed. And my example was Butcher. Mm -hmm. I was like, look at this guy, like his backswing doesn't even go higher than his butt, and, yeah, and he's extremely accurate. Uh, he's well, to a, to an extent, accurate enough at least. Um, he has great control with the bowling ball. He has a big flat spot. So he, like at the snap of like when it's close to his release, he knows if it's going a little left or a little right and he can make like little minor. He just has an in incredible touch. And, yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. Like with, with Jacob is, uh, people kind of, you know, rag on him. He's like, Oh, they, they, he, he's not very good. He has a weird style. He sprays it, whatever. Like, like, no, like he has tremendous touch. Like he knows he can do things with the bowling ball more than people realize <laughs> yeah that oh yeah he's got so many tricks when he won uh when he won indianapolis this this year he was throwing urethane but he was doing something different with urethane than i've seen him do he wasn't he wasn't trying to create a hook spot he was actually kind of fading it back yeah 
and it was kind of like I've seen him create shapes where it's like kind of like loopy, and then he just gets your thing to dig and come in. But then in the show in Indianapolis, he was kind of like more direct with it, and I think more up the back and softer. Mm-hmm. No, the, the kid's just talented, man. He's just yeah, very. But yeah, I the West. I I love when people talk about like <laughs> that joke. I mean, he wins everything. That's in, that's insane. And yeah. Dean, I don't even know how much Dean bowls anymore when he finished second. That's really that's really impressive too. Yeah, like uh, what are we supposed to do? It's not like we're like letting him win. Like <laughs> I know, that's, like there's some good bowlers on the West Coast. Like there's some great bowlers on the West Coast. You have you, yeah. you have the things. You have PJ Haggerty. You have uh, Dean when he bowls regionals. Uh, who else? Who are the Blanch- Blanchard? Yeah, Blanchard bowls the West. Um, I mean, Chris Warren's still a really good bowler, and he bowls He's everything. Amazing. Chris Warren's amazing. Um, we have all the local players who are really good, who just bowl the one or two a year. So, yeah, I was talking to uh, who was I talking to? Cortez Shank. He uh, he's no longer going to Wichita State. He was in back to Arizona, and he, he was like, "I just want to be on the West Coast. Like the West Coast is totally underrated when it comes to to talent and bowlers. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of there's a lot of great talent out on the West Coast." Yeah, we uh, uh, Blanchard came up and bowled one of our Swisses, and it was like, "Man, there's a lot of good bowlers up here. You just never really heard of them." Like, well, we're we're small up here, but like we're ultra competitive. Like, there's a lot of good bowlers. Like. I just won a tournament recently and against the best in the Northwest. And like these guys can bowl, they can flat out bowl. Yeah, definitely. And uh, it's just, there's not much uh, opportunity to, there's no, really no reason to kind of, I guess, uh, work hard to like um, get your name known, I guess, in this region. Cause there's just not a lot to bowl either. And it's just, cause it's just a small region. There's less lane beds than the Midwest and all that. Like, um, we don't have very many centers over 32 lanes around here. So there's not a lot of, uh, just not a lot of stuff, but, um, now where do you live exactly? Uh, I live in Tacoma, which is, uh, about, about 30 miles South of Seattle, the greater Seattle area kind of just runs together here, the Western Washington. And but, you, uh, do you travel to Oregon sometimes too? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, uh, travel to Portland. Um, that's actually the tournament I won a couple of weeks ago was in Portland and, uh, the OBA, which is probably the premier scratch, uh, club on the West coast right now. And that's the one I talked about where all the, that one's hard to win. That one's Dean talks about it too, about how that one's pretty much as hard to win than a regional just because one, the format and two, just the quality of bowlers that bowl every time, like. You, you talk about bowlers who just whack it. Like, like every tournament has someone who just whacks it. And it's just so hard to win. Yeah. yeah. Are they on house shots? No. Uh, I think like the non champs maybe are on house shots and maybe one of the doubles are on softer patterns, but it's usually on challenge or sports shots. Like we just bowled on Badger all weekend, two weekends ago. So that was oh. fun. I practiced on a, a 50 foot. There's a youth league around here on Tuesday nights, and I they I bowled on the leftover. It was a 50 foot junior gold pattern. That was hard, man. Like I feel like uh, uh-huh. USBC does a really good job of just making the patterns hard. I don't know what it is. I also feel they do a pretty good job of making the left to right ratio pretty good as well. Yeah, I'm a big fan of the asymmetrical patterns. Um, really? Yeah. I uh, let me uh. Let me preface this. I don't know much about like pattern building. I really don't. But yeah, go ahead. Um, it, it's it's pretty uh, obvious that it, there's there's less left-handed bowlers, so you're gonna have to make a pattern to cater to that. And whether and I'm gonna bring up uh, the draft for the Masters. How it, it, I think this is what I'm thinking of. It was pretty lopsided. Like it, it was pretty asymmetrical, right? Yeah. And um, I think some people kind of got mad about it. And look, um, we don't see very many true asymmetrical patterns, so it's going to take some time before they figure out like what actually works or not. So I'm okay. Like it sucks that maybe some lefties felt shut out or whatever, but like uh, I'm a fan of it because at least we're trying to make it a little bit even. Because you look at look, go back to Jacob. Like Jacob's a really good bowler, but when the left side's his playground for the whole tournament and you know, the, all the right-handers have to switch balls four times and make moves every eight frames. And, and Jacob kind of, kind of groove his line in there. It gets a little annoying. <laughs> oh yeah. 100%. So 
like I, I agree with the asymmetrical pattern thing. Yeah. So maybe I don't know. Um, I just don't know. Uh, I don't know much about pattern building, so I can't really comment much on it. So, but I do like the idea of having asymmetrical patterns and try to even that out a little bit and just try to make it a little bit more fair. I've heard some guys say that they don't like it simply because we're not bowling on the same thing. Like it's not fair that we're not bowling on the same thing, or it's not okay that we're not bowling on the same thing. Yeah. And it's like, okay, I get that, but we're never bowling on the same thing. Like the the men mentality, the strategy, ball choices, lines, angles, geometry, everything about bowling on the left side is totally different. Transition moves, everything you do is totally different than the right side. Doesn't no matter what you do. No matter if you make a asymmetric, symmetric, there's just a totally different game plan involved with being a lefty than being a righty. And sometimes that plays into an advantage and sometimes that doesn't play into an advantage, but it's always different in my mind. Like even, yeah. if, even if it's a symmetrical pattern, it's still different just because it's a different ball game. Totally different ball. It's two completely different things. Yeah, and I'm not trying to like sound like I'm bashing lefties or anything like that. Oh, no, um, no for sure. Because uh, like, I, I talked to a couple of the local lefties who are really good, and like they they come up to me and they're like, man, you know, I got to account for all the righties moving into my area and my friends are about to go and all that stuff. So it's not like, um, it's not like lefties don't see stuff. Like they, they see plenty of stuff that they think about that I actually didn't realize until I actually talked to left-handers and see their transition like that. Cause they actually worry about us, the righties moving into their territory a lot of the times mm -hmm. and that forces them to get left or do weird things too. So, um, yep. that's something to think about as well. And it's, pretty common of what the right hander's supposed to do now like if you're a right hander that bowls a lot you you have a good understanding of like what types of balls you throw in certain situ situations and what balls you like and uh -huh. um, and so the the it's it's a pattern almost like almost every pattern um lane pattern gives you eventually it does almost the same thing or something you've seen before so you have an idea so if you bowl the first game and you go to the next pair, the next one goes. So you just move left, and you move left, and it's kind of like the same thing over and over again. So we kind of have like a game plan at this yeah. point of what to do and how to attack lanes, and so that's good for us. But the lefties, it's it's different. They they don't see friction and then just move right. You know, sometimes they move left, sometimes they fall mm -hmm. down, sometimes they throw it harder, sometimes they back off of it. Um, whereas we just move left. We don't even we don't even jack with the friction. Like the second. Yeah. <laughs> This and that's a that's probably a tour thing to think about, but yeah, it is. <laughs> friction, we move left because we have to. There's yeah. like no jacking around with it. You now you can't just throw it harder; it's still gonna hook. Now you can't just ball down because that's not the right ball. So it, there's a pattern that the right handers go through almost every single time they bowl, and the lefties they have their own different like battles. Um, the only thing is, is they don't see they just don't see as much transition as we do. So they they see transition, just not the the intense version that the right-handers see. Yeah, exactly. It, it's they, they see the transition. It's just not the same pattern transition that we see. A lot of it's like more front to back, more mm -hmm. like you know balls and maybe drillings and like hand positions, and they like stay in their little realm and they just try and figure it out. And a lot of times that's really frustrating because if we're say we bowl bad game one and we're in this like little part of the lane and we didn't bowl very good. And then the next pair hooks and we move in and shoot 260 because it hooks, you know, that's good. That's good for us. But the lefties don't necessarily have that. They don't have that next pair that just hooks a bunch and they move two arrows left to, to the right. And yeah, a lot of times they stay in their little realm that they usually stay in and they just beat their brains in because they, they can't, you know, they can't figure it out. Yeah. But then there's also times where, you know, they have the nuts and they never have to move. So it's like, I mean, what do you do? Yeah. Which, um, the, De I just got done bowl. Well, I went to the Detroit cup, Billy Isolt's event and I love his events. You know, I love that he's works really hard and I love what he does. But, you know, when there's 19 spots up for grabs and 95 bowlers and, um, you know, 10 of them are lefties, you know, that, that kind of, that's a struggle. 10 lefties made the cut? Yeah. Yeah. So he, he paid one in five. There were 19 guys, 95 bowlers, and 10 of them are lefties. So there's like 70 right-handed bowlers, you know, mm -hmm. for nine spots. Mm -hmm. And you have very good bowlers. Tommy Jones, yeah, yeah, yeah. like you're facing some really good right handers. So basically a pro event. Yeah. It be, yeah. It becomes extremely tough to cash in that event, especially since it's one in five. So. Right. 
And I almost bowled that. I actually looked at bowling that, but uh, couldn't quite swing it. Yeah. So, um, what do you? Nice. Go ahead. I was gonna say it was that's a that's a good event that I really tried to bowl because it was actually in Detroit. It wasn't in any surrounding or like two hour away small town or whatever. I'd actually fly into Detroit, a major city, and bowl it. But just oh yeah, that matters. This year. Yeah. It's kind of nice. I kind of take for granted living in the Midwest because I can drive to a lot of places. I can drive to Indy, Detroit, yeah. uh, Oklahoma. I can even drive to Dallas if I want to. It's like nine hours. Jonesboro. I can yeah. drive to a lot of places. You can't. No. I mean, I can. It's just not It's not very good. <laughs> I mean, how far away is Reno? Reno's about an 11-hour drive. And then Vegas has to be, what, 20? Yeah, Vegas is 18. Oh, God. So even the, even the events that are on the Northwest, you're still not close to yeah, um, I fly to all the regionals in Northern California and Reno. Usually the airfares are pretty decent, so it's, it's basically cost as much as two tanks of gas or whatever, and it saves me five, six hours. Oh, a lot of time. That, yeah, that's not bad. Yeah. You can for cheap. That's not yeah. bad at all. Um, yeah, last, last year I got pretty pretty good flights and pretty much everything at bold, so that's why I was able to kind of go chase the points and do that. So what do you think, what do you think is um, – what do you think on a, on a higher level of bowling? What do you think the patterns should look like? Do you have an idea? Do you think they should be a little easier and higher scoring? Or do you think it should be like super tough? Do you think it um, well, uh, it's easy to say on the higher level, you want the patterns to be tough. And I agree. Right. Um, like take from the masters, like the cut, number was way lower than you would think like um we just got yeah. done bowling uh the toc the tpc and the indianapolis tournament and i i can't remember what exact scores but you know they're pretty high scoring right they were pretty they, were, they weren't soft patterns but they were just high scoring patterns yeah and to go bowl the usbc masters and have cut that low it was just like oh, like what like I know they, they felt impossible. Like I couldn't just move left and jack on it. What's going on here? Like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So um, I, I personally like the the harder stuff because um, yeah, my chats are doing something over here. Um, it it feels like it gives me like the the not so world class bowler, I guess, a chance at you know a little bit better chance than having to. It it's nice not going in having to know you have to shoot two thirty every game. Well, define world class bowler because I'm not so sure a lower rev rate guy, we say lower, but lower yeah. rev rating compared to Belmo really has a great chance to become a, a world class bowler. Uh, look at the show at the Masters, man. Look at the show. You yeah. had, uh, who'd you have? You had Andrew played in, but then you had Klumpkin, Hoskins, Ryan. Joey Pants. And then Joey Pants. Joey Pants, dude. Look at that. Look at that lineup. When I yeah. see some, when I see something like that, I love it. I don't know what the general public sees about it. I don't know what they think about it. Like if if someone random is watching ESPN and they're watching it, I don't know what they think about it. But I love that. I think it's really cool. Yeah. Um. That's a good point. That's another good point. Like I don't know what the general public thinks because I don't. I don't really talk to people. I don't talk to the general public, but uh. uh that lineup on TV, I liked it too because you had a little bit of everything on the show. You had, you know, you had Andrew, who's pretty much I would put him world class pro at this point. Yeah, he's a phenomenal bowler. Yeah, and uh, he is, and I would put him a little higher rev rate as well. Yeah. Uh, then you have Hoskins, who who I would say is a decent rev rate player, but I wouldn't put him in world class. And then you have you know Pants, who's a uh, kind of an old school, uh, up the lane type of guy, and Rhino, you know, is another a world class bowler, left hander. And then uh, uh, Compton, who's you know trying the same category as Hoskins. So I saw that happening, by the way. Your Perrier. <laughs> I know. Your team's empty. I lost that whole thing. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I kind of on the same page as you. That was really nice to see because it gives uh, it gives people like us a little bit of uh, a little bit of hope that we don't have to be Marshall Kent or Belmonte or pray their rev rate type of guy to make a TV show. Hey, hey, stop. God, freaking zoo over here. <laughs> the uh, they just had the PBA Tour Finals, and I don't know if it's aired yet. I don't know. Uh, I didn't pay much attention to it, but I get. I bet you the top eight consisted of Belmo, EJ, Marshall, Dom, Jesper, uh, 
three other guys, Rash. But I guarantee you, like, it was a fairly soft pattern. And it was just a, you know, it was just a bomb fest. Like, how hard can you hit it and how hard, how much can you get it to hook? Uh-huh. And I guess, I guess there's, like, some cool things about that. Like, definitely those guys are unbelievable at it. I mean, unbelievable. They're, they're, it's fun they're, to watch stripes. Yeah, exactly. It is. But then, like, there's also an element of being able to watch shot makers, you know, out yeah. shot make people. And the cool thing was this year, this year at the Masters, I made my first cut and I got Barnes, and I drew Barnes based on the pattern you don't want to draw Barnes on. Yeah. And uh, and so I played right most of the time. I I didn't have a very I I played left on the double burn, but for the most part on the two freshes I played right. And and I don't get to do that very often. And I wasn't definitely wasn't the sharpest, but I was catching doubles. I was making enough good shots to catch a couple doubles a game and shoot two zero and. I ended with 70 over and made the cut. So when I went into match play to bowl Barnes, I knew he was going to play right. So, okay. So do I, do I sit here and I, do I try and play right against the best bowler in the world? At playing right? <laughs> um, or do I, uh, do I try and get in and, you know, try and create some friction to make him get in or do, you know, what's my game plan here. And as I'm like going through this game plan and I'm trying to like accumulate, I, I fell in love with it a little bit because that's not normally the case. A lot of times it's just to get left fest and bang on uh-huh. it. Yep. Uh, but now it's like I'm sitting here trying to strategically think of a way to beat a shot maker. Okay, so do I play right? And ultimately I, I did play right, and uh, he, he won. But <laughs> that just that scenario was cool because it's not normally like that. It's normally just like, okay, I got Belmo, and he's going to play – shoot 780 slow wheel in the lane because when he slow wheels a lane he's unbeatable yeah. so you know that's that's cool and everything but like you know a, a fresh like pattern like that where it's super low scoring and there's more to think about there's more areas you can play you can play in your comfort zone if you want to yeah i don't know i, I just thought it was cool yeah uh what was i gonna say um oh that's a good point about how you were talking about uh, staying right and like instead of automatically thinking I'm gonna have to get left and and bang on it and wheel it, you're like oh I can do this do that do that. It's like uh, when I bowled on the tour stuff, like the first game or two I'm usually pretty good. Like I can stay right and kind of keep things in front of me and I don't have to uh, do too many crazy stuff. But like as soon as we get in, later in the blocks, I struggle with getting in and really truly like wheeling it with these guys and so the thing about the master's pattern that I liked too was even when they broke down, I didn't have to move it like left. I could have, I didn't have to wheel it. I didn't have to play that kind of like pro tour wheel uh, right away. It got there at times, but like, right. It was, it was nice that I didn't have to automatically do that. There were other options. I could, I could actually use hand tricks that I grew, like we talked about growing up, learning how to bowl on certain things. Like I, I grew up with certain hand tricks and, I feel like I can't use them half the time on tour, but like there, I felt like I could. And that was really nice. Cause it was like, Oh, I can actually like kind of, I feel like I can actually trick it and shoot two teen and not lose 30 to the field. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's, that's interesting because when we bowled the, the players championship, the format was uh, two, two blocks of five games each day for 30 yeah. games. And then they, uh, and re- each block was fresh. Each each block was fresh, and then they redid it after 30 games to where you bowled with the people that you were close to. They seeded it down for the last day of 10 games. Yeah. And for the first 30 games, um, or was it 20 games? I guess it was 20 games, and then 30 games total before they cut to a show, right? Is that the right? Yeah, the first two days we had the cross, and then the last day they reseeded us. So 30 blocks. total games. So for the yeah, first 30. 20 games, for the first two days, I bowled to the right of Marshall. And the pattern was... What was the pattern like? It wasn't hard, but it also wasn't like terribly high scoring. I think if you averaged like 220 on it, you know, you were, you were close. But so I watched Marshall. He, he stood left the entire time. He never even attempted throwing a ball right of 15 on the fresh, whatever. Mm -hmm. He pretty much stood in the same spot all five games, maybe made like a ball change here or there, but he had such a good look that he didn't need to. He didn't need to try anything else. There were like there was no there wasn't anything that made him deviate from that plan. 
And so when you look at something like that, okay, Marshall's, you know, he starts out at fourth arrow on the fresh and he ends at fifth arrow. So he's moving five boards in five games because he's starting so much far, farther left than everyone. He's right. hitting the hole every single time because he's a good shot maker when, he, when he's doing that. Uh -huh. I think he's a good shot maker in general. But how do you beat that? How do you beat a guy who's comfortable where he's at? He understands what balls to throw. He doesn't have to move. So if, if you don't have that, what do you do? Do you try and do what he's doing? Do you try and create your own plan that's going to involve more moving? Because the more you move, the more transition you're going to see and the more advantage he has. Uh, do, you, do you go back home and try and develop a trick of playing left to fourth arrow to where you don't have to move? Okay, what does that entail? How do you do that? How do you do what Marshall does? How do you do what Belmont does? Well, we can't do it. But Marshall kind of has the same kind of like slow wheel thing that, that Belmont does that he's just unbelievably good at. And if you don't have that, I don't know. I don't know how you beat him, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if I had the answer to that question, I, I wouldn't be here. Exactly. Like, <laughs> like, a pattern like the Masters, it's not just like stand here, throw here. Yeah. It's so much more than that. Okay, well – I shot 210, which is a good game on this pair. And then I go over here and I got five and then I washed out and then I threw a bad shot. And then I uh, picked a spare and then I threw another bad shot because I'm uncomfortable. And now you're thinking a lot more. There's a lot like more going on in your head rather than just like standing here, throwing here for five games, every single block. I threw, I threw a four bagger at the masters and I think I got pretty excited and fist pumped it. And I was like, yeah, this feels great. Like I, <laughs> Like I actually earned that four bagger versus like sometimes I feel like I'm bowling and it's just like oh through four bagger I'm still somehow behind the field. Oh exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, like if, like when those patterns are high scoring at the World Series, if you start out spare 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 spare, like you're like crap. <laughs> like, yeah, you get the, you get yeah, it in I, pocket every time and now strike I once. Have, now I have to have a five bagger. And the thing is, is so those patterns those patterns are easy, but it doesn't necessarily make them easy to strike on to begin with. That's exactly right. When you go to another pair, they're different. They're always yep. different. so you have to learn how to line up quickly. If you start your first five frames off with a spare or maybe even open, you can only strike out for two thirty. You're behind the pace. Yep. <laughs> no matter how that game ends. The games where you start out like uh, strike wrap ten, strike nine pin, strike four pin, you're like, crap, like <laughs> I'm not I'm not missing the pocket, but I can only match for two forty now and like and then you have to throw the seven bag you're late in the game to do it. <laughs> I know. And so you, you, you might think that's the wrong ball and you change balls and you two eight ten and you're like, well, I'm just I'm leaving. <laughs> oh, yep. Yep. Withdraw. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Ryan Council, what's up, man? In the chat. He said, uh, sweet plaque behind you, Brad. So I got this plaque. This uh this crazy thing happened one day. I don't even know if I can take it off the wall. Oh, I just took the nail off. Really? So I got this plaque where one night in league, that might be backwards, but me and council, oh, your buddies with council. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I know council. Me and council and some guys broke the world record for the team game at 1434. And it was just like the most amazing experience ever doing it with your buddies, but also just so much luck involved that it was just the, it was the coolest night ever. It was on November 30th, and we uh, it was the oh, last time that, yeah. in November, and we, we were all, like, super scruffy and flanning into this video. <laughs> it was when flanning and first started to do a video, and, uh, yeah, it was uh, – and when he did the video, he, he videoed our 10th frame, and we're all throwing it everywhere because it's on <laughs> Super China. And so there was so much hate, and the <laughs> was there, like, oh, my God, what are they bowling on? Like, uh, we, uh, we threw it everywhere. That's awesome. <laughs> it, was, it was a cool night. And the the previous uh, people who had the record were from St. Louis. It was our coach, Randy Lightfoot. So that was that was like a I don't know, probably one of my best experiences bowling, period, man. I don't know. But Bowl what's your uh, what's your what's your best experience? You won a title actually. I want to talk about that. Okay. So where'd you win a title at? Where? I won in the Middle East. <laughs> I know. What Qatar? Qatar, yeah. Okay. Uh, Qatar Open 2015. How did that go? How was, uh, how was that? That was actually pretty fun. <laughs> well, yeah. uh, it was like uh, um, I bowled really well, and, and it felt good. I think I led qualifying that year too. Like I had this monster set in qualifying. I was like 320 overs something like that for six games, and uh, I was able to make the step ladder. This is uh so uh, 
most people know I'm pretty good international bowler. And so <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, did, I did a lot of crap for that sometimes. But uh, this is the, this was the third year. I bowled, I went to Qatar the first year in um, 2013, I think. I think Marshall and I and Matt Gazin uh, said, screw it, let's go to bowl international event. I, I, Middle East is really cool. It's always fascinated me. So I really wanted to go to that part of the world. And I had a big money tournament over there. So we went. And uh, I ended up making the TV show the first year I went bold it, so that's pretty cool. And then uh, I did, I bowled terrible on TV show. And then uh, the next year uh, we went again, and I made the TV show again. And I think that was my senior year in college. So the, the first year we went was my junior year in college. And then the second year we went was my senior year. And then uh, in 2015 I went after I graduated and uh, again made the TV show. Uh, I had to bowl Marshall the first round, of course. Uh, we travel. We travel outside the world just to bowl each other again. And uh, Marshall and I hate losing to each other. So our match, I think the final score was like five twenty to five ten for a two game match. Like we did not miss. It was a lot of fun, <laughs> I guess. And then um, the other match was like four forty to four twenty or something like that. <laughs> and so uh, we d we didn't want to lose to each other. But I ended up winning, and then uh, I double shot in the title match, and that was a uh, kind of low scoring a little bit too. I think you only shot about four fifty. But uh, were they hard? Uh, not really. Uh, I mean, it, it was like we talked about. Like, it wasn't that they were hard or easy. It was just kind of like it, it was softer, but like you still had to try to. It was hard to strike at times and. Yeah, um, I, I don't remember the exact numbers for the cut, but usually the European stuff gets to about 180 over or so. So about, I guess that's what 230 average for six games. Maybe that's a little bit too high. Maybe it was like 150 that year. I can't remember. But anyway, um, I had a good look. <laughs> uh, I remember. Uh, I remember last year at Rash's place. You went to Rash's tournament last year, right? Uh, yeah, when he ran it, it wasn't last year. It was two years ago. He didn't have one last year. What? Yeah. Rash didn't have an event last year? Not last year, no. The year before he did. Okay, so maybe the year before. We were we were sitting at the table and Marshall was kinda like a couple pairs down. I think he was like standing at the ball return and you were like, and I was asking you about your win. And I was like, So who'd you bowl in the final or whatever? And he goes, Well, I I, I bowled Marshall. And I was like, Oh wow, that's a that's a good win. You go yeah, I always beat Marshall, so that was a game. <laughs> and, and you said it loud. You said it loud enough for him to hear. <laughs> <laughs> and then you were like, "Yeah." Then I bowled Rash and won. I don't know. I thought that was funny. Yeah. Did you feel like when you won that day? Did you feel like you were on top of the world? Did you feel like you were the best? Did you feel like you could beat anybody? You know, um, I don't. I don't know. It was kind of. I'm not gonna use the word surreal, but like it was kind of hazy because i was just so in a zone where i didn't really worry about anything i was just trying to like finish the tournament without falling on my face yeah and uh i just wanted to go up there and make the shots like i want to make every shot count and you know i was bowling really well i was like oh man i'm in the title match like i can't believe this is happening so i'm just gonna you know psh, you know face forward and go after <laughs> it and um i i ended up uh actually i won sitting on the bench uh i think I think Sean two eight ten in the tenth or whatever, to, and I didn't even have to go up and throw my tenth frame to win. And it, it kind of hit me. I watched him throw the shot, and he missed. And I was like, I'm "Like, is it over? Like, you know, <laughs> can't believe, like, are you, like, are you kidding me? Like, I'm champion now." And the best part was, I didn't even realize it was a PBA tour title until people started telling me afterwards. Whoa! I just, so, like, uh, I know, I know, the Qatar Open was, you know, like a big international event. So, like, that felt great to win that. It was a World Bowling Tour EBT event. I was like, great, you know international superstar over here for you know a week and uh so i was like that's so cool and then people were like oh man you, you won your first pba title i'm like what <laughs> you're kidding me like i know i was like oh cool yeah international title like, no 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 pba title i'm like what <laughs> so like i didn't even realize that and then i uh, got the phone call for banner and all that i was like damn i guess it's real <laughs> crazy yeah well, i think that's uh i think that's pretty common that when you're not winning or when you're not doing very good or when you're fantasizing about winning or you make it seem so great, like that's going to be like the most amazing feeling in the world. And maybe eventually it will feel great. But like when you actually do it, you don't, you don't give it the attention or you don't give it the high that you do when you think about winning. Yeah. So when you dream about it, you think of it as like the most amazing thing ever. And then you do it and you don't 
you think of it as like, you know, not real life or you don't like actually enjoy it like you thought you would when you dream about it until maybe like a year later and you think about it or a couple weeks later or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I was um, kind of, on a much smaller scale. I bowled a lot of regionals in my life <laughs> and, I've only, <laughs> and I've only won one until a couple weeks ago. I won my second one and I thought, you know, I bowled a lot of these and I just think like, winning would be the greatest thing ever. And then I won and I was like, you know, I'm just driving home. Like it was just another day. Like yeah. <laughs> I didn't like, I definitely did not give it the, the energy that I gave it when I thought about it. So. it uh, it's it's kind of like uh, the thinking of, you know, act like you won before or whatever. And um, yeah. Uh, yeah. I've won some pretty big tournaments and I've, I've done well. And it's just like, you're, you're right. Like they're, 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 you don't, like you're super excited, like going into it, and like you're probably gonna be super excited when you get home. Or like when I finished second in Sweden, like it was like I lost to Belmonte, and like I made it to the TV show there, and like I was flying home. I was flying home in economy class. Like I was just a normal person. Like we, we you know, we we don't really like try to put ourselves on a pedestal necessarily, because like I think that's just indicative of who we are. Like yeah. I'm still I'm still just me. I just happen to have a good week or whatever. <laughs> Yeah, how was the uh, the Lucky Larson's event? Was that a, was that a good one? Yeah, I enjoyed it. It was a uh, it was really they were, they were hard that week, right? Oh, they were they were hard. It was one of the harder patterns I've ever bowled on, probably. <laughs> um, especially for like an EBT event or WBT event, because they've been kind of lately the last few years they've been historically like high scoring the WBT and EBT stuff. So to go in there and have to, I think the cut was 70 over for the six game block and i was i got in with 80 over and knew i was in soft i was like but i was like pressing for that 80 over <laughs> right and uh you know and i found a trick that worked on that pattern and that's what kind of carried me all the way to the title match what was the trick uh staying behind it i was like dead up the back of it and that just blended the back end just enough to where i actually had a decent amount of room and could, could strike and stay right and uh because uh uh, Belmo obviously bowled well. Pontus bowled well too, and he he kind of likes to get in and and give it a little little berth. Yeah. And so true. I couldn't. I I was like I tried to do that my first block, and then I I don't know if it was jet lag or what, but I just wasn't doing anything. My ball there's a lot of out of bounds, and there's a lot of cliff like uh like kind of like that where the ball would either go dead left or dead right. And then I ended up uh, the last game of the first block I bowled, I ended up just trying to like keep my try to feel my hand like way up the back of it and just let it tumble down lane and it worked i was like great maybe i just do this next block and get you know 80 over and get in and that's what i did and then I ended up actually even getting better as the week went on did did it give you shim yeah it gave me a little bit of shim and it gave me a little uh early hook to the right to really? give me that, that room it just just enough to give me a little bit comfortable and to kind of make the shots and get some strikes to shoot two teen uh maybe bust out 230 every now and then and that's what pretty much carried me the whole way. You cool. didn't need to shoot 230 though, every game. That was another one of those tournaments where um, it, uh, it kept me out of trouble too. I, might, I made a lot of spares and just took care of business and got to the top match where I got run over, but I mean, still, they got me there. It's amazing how when they're hard, how little it takes for a person to become confident. Mm -hmm. Like when they're, when they're really hard and you have to narrow your focus in and your mind in on hitting like this small spot and then you get a little bit of room, how much joy that brings you just to know that you you now have the ability to shoot 230, whereas before you felt like you had to be perfect to shoot 210. Yeah. And, and all it is is just little. Like, if you had that amount of room on an easy pattern, you'd hate your life. But <laughs> if you're on a hard pattern, you're, you know, you're, the, you're super happy. When you yeah. – uh, so what was the format of that event? So there's a bunch of qualifying squads, and then they cut to a certain amount, and then a step ladder? Yeah, um – uh, you're talking about the Lucky Larson Masters, right? Uh, uh, it's it was a EBT event, I think. So like the the, the standard EBT format is uh, you have like five or six days. I think they did like two weeks. They they really made this a big event. But you have uh, six game block qualifying and you know unlimited reentry, and you just you, if you can get on a squad, you can bowl it. And uh, then they cut to um, I don't remember the exact numbers, but they make a cut. After um, you know all the qualifying, usually it's usually top forty or so or whatever. I can't I, again. I can't remember what they did here. Right. But then we bowled another six game block, I think. 
and pins don't usually carry over. I don't think they did here. Again, I, I can't remember, but uh, yeah, usually you pull the qualifying, and then you pull like a six game block, and then I think we pulled like another six game block, and then our total scores created the top four step ladder. And um, well, where'd you qualify? I qualified somewhere in the middle, and then uh, I bowled really well during the semis, and then I ended up qualifying second for the TV show. And then uh, who'd you beat on the show? Uh, I ended up bowling uh, Yari Yari Rapta, I think is it. I, I'm sure I'm saying his name wrong, but he's a good player from Finland. Um, and I ended up beating him, and then I lost to Belmo in the title match. I watched a, I watched a couple of shots of, I think it was only, maybe I watched the whole match of your and Belmo's match, and I saw how you were playing the lanes. I saw you were playing in and kind of just fading it back. Yeah. Looking for Shem, essentially. And then Belmo was just doing what he does. He's so good when, they're, like, when it's a, a medium pattern that's really difficult. Yeah, I bowled well. I bowled. I I bowled really well. I should say that. And Belmo bowled a game against me in the title match that was higher than my highest game that week. So <laughs> it was just like, I was like, cool. Like I started out with a double. I'm like, man, I'm gonna win. <laughs> and yeah. then he he goes like spare spare like sits bad here. I'm like, yeah, yeah there it is. <laughs> <laughs> he's he's stupid good man. When yeah. he at the at the TOC this year, he had I think the first block he didn't he didn't bowl very good. And then the next block he comes out with urethane and he's fading it back from like fourth arrow with urethane. And I'm just like, really. <laughs> you know, and he goes like you know 180 over or something like that and he gets back in it and he makes the show well actually no because he made the top 24 barely he yeah. did something he did something um i don't know maybe the last game of qualifying to get in no someone messed up someone missed an easy spare for belmont to get in and i'm just sitting there like of course you know <laughs> of course <laughs> like that's the last thing everybody wants is belmont in the top 24 yeah. and then i was talking to devaney a little bit later about like mindset and stuff and he goes you just got to believe he goes that he said that mother effort down there <laughs> he's pointing down the very far pair because he's 24th he goes that mother effort down there He'll make the show, and sure enough, yep. <laughs> it's like yep. what? Like, gosh, dang it, man! You can't give you can't even give him an ounce. He's just gonna magnify it into just beating your butt. Yeah, that's uh, like uh, going back to what we we're talking about, like uh, world class bowlers and what what separates them from like like we consider ourselves pretty good bowlers and you know some of the best in the world, but like yeah. these guys. It, it's just that mental thing that that belief or that like I like to say they know they're gonna make TV show like they know mm -hmm. this move is correct. It's not a belief. It's they know it, mm -hmm. and they could be wrong, but that attitude of knowing it and knowing that they're gonna do it or they can't. They yeah. yeah, it's it's hard to teach. It's hard to learn. Like we're still working on it. Apparently. Oh yeah, definitely. And uh, like if you if you don't if you don't see your ball do the right thing for me for me it's okay i see what the the balls that are having success and the people that are having success i see what their ball's doing and then i watch my ball and it's not doing that so i'm almost like a real <laughs> a realist in the sense of like i know what my ball's doing and i know what ball is making the shows and i know they're different so it's hard for since i'm a realist and i understand what my ball's doing it's hard for me to like believe that yeah, this is going to make the show when 17 other things that are doing the same thing are making the show in reality. I don't know. Maybe it's sometimes good not to be a realist. I don't know. <laughs> sometimes <laughs> you just got to shut off your brain and go. And... Well, I know. If you if you truly believe you're going to make the show, though, and you don't, then you just shake it off and say, okay, I'm just going to make the next one. Like, it's just always – like, it's this it, – it makes not doing well a lot easier, too, because I, I, the uh, marshal at the Masters this year, he needed – we were on the double burn the last block, and he needed something like two twenty the last game or something like that, and he didn't get there. And he shot like one hundred and ninety or maybe one hundred and eighty or maybe he opened in the tenth shoot one hundred and eighty or something. It was close. And then like you know he just acted as if everything was cool, and you know that's just because he knows that you know if it's not this one it's the next one. He knows yeah. he doesn't like think that he knows that, and and he actually ended up making the cut anyway. So like. It also makes handling um, less fortunate situations a lot easier as well. If yeah. you, you just believe, I mean, it can be fake. You know, you don't, you don't like, you know, if you go out there for 10 years and never make a show, 
then you know you might as well do that thinking you're knowing you're going to make the show than not knowing you're going to make the show like even if it doesn't make any sense even if there's a guy out there that you know he's arrogant or cocky and he he knows he's going to make the show even though everyone knows he's never going to make a show then hey man props to him man. that's hard to teach man that that mentality is incredibly hard to teach or to have in general if we didn't think we're gonna win, like, why would we go out there and compete? Like, yeah, exactly. That's uh, also the thing. We joke about going to cut a check or make the cut or or have a good week, but like, I mean, we were we're our goal out there for us is to go win. Like, I and mean, that that's what we're trying to reach. Like, we're not there to to be a fish or to cut the check. Okay. Like, we'll we'll take the cut the check most of the time, but yeah. <laughs> like, it, it it's the attitude. You gotta have the attitude that you're gonna win and not even on tour stuff, but even local stuff, and especially to anyone watching who bowls their local scratch events, like you don't go there to, you got to set the bar a little bit higher. You got to go out there and say, I'm going to win. I'm going to beat the best players around here. And if you don't, then you don't. Like someone's got to lose, right? Only one person to win every week. But right. it's, it's that attitude that, that kind of starts to separate like your game. Like you start to kind of make the unconscious decisions. Like, oh, it, it goes back to like knowing you're good enough to make this shot or make this game. And, it, it just starts to add up over time. Like I go into local events. I'm like, I'm going to run everyone over and I don't oh, most of the time, but um, sometimes I do. And yeah. I think if I didn't have the attitude, I wouldn't have some of the focus I have during some of these events. And that, it just comes from like, it's not arrogance or anything. It's just a way of thinking. I think uh, McNeil was talking to me one day. We were in Iowa born 11th frame or fusion or something. And, and he was like, you know, you you bowl, what did he say? He said, if you can bowl, if you can bowl out of your mind, great 5% of the time. So if, if you can bowl great, those times that you have it mm -hmm. 5% of the time, a 5% win rate's good. Um, and if you can just bowl good enough to be in contention, like the other 40% of the time, then that like 50% half the time, you're at least close. And yeah. if, if you can pull it away 5% of the time, that's a pretty good ratio. And he said the other the other half times you're not going to bowl very good. And he think he said think about that. Half the times you're not going to bowl very good. That's a lot. Mm -hmm. That's a lot. But if you can nail it down that five percent of the time, you know that's that's what it's all about, really. Yep. Um, I was going to say something else. What was I going to say? What were we talking about before I just spoke about McNeil? Uh. Oh, I was gonna I was gonna say like if you just talked to Belmo, and it's not an arrogant factor because, you know. Belmo definitely has every right to be arrogant if he wanted to be, but I think there's a lot of situations where he's not. But it, it, if you if you just talk to him, you can tell that he really like he believes. And at this point in time, obviously, like yeah, man, he's just he's just so good that there's no reason for him not to think so. But um, for him to get to that point, you know, you, it's it's all mindset. You just you just have to teach yourself the mindset. And even if it's not real, like I say, even if it's not realistic, it's still the most important thing. Just in like quality of life too, man. If you go out there and just beat your brains in and just you're not feeling yourself and you're not confident about it and you're just, you know, here and there and you're just not quite sure what to think and you're just, you know, it's an extremely difficult life. Just outside, uh -huh. outside of the bowling center as well. Like, yeah, it's nutty. <laughs> It can be like an extremely just tough gig, but I mean, if if you think about it, you can you can learn a lot about yourself by doing it. I mean, I think it's a great experience, even though it doesn't feel like it at times. You know, it's definitely a great experience. And look at a, a guy like you, like you went out to the Qatar and won, and like you felt the highest of highs. Mm -hmm. And you always have that to look back on, you know. And you always know you can do it. That's one thing I was gonna say. Frankie Lavoie came up to me at the at the players I think this year, and he didn't bowl very good. And he was like, man, I'm just kind of in a slump. You know, I don't know what to do about it. And I was like, well, I mean, it happens. But the main thing you should be focusing on is you know how to win. You know, mm -hmm. you're you're a very dominant player in, in a lot of ways that when the pattern plays right and you can play straight, you know what phenomenal bowling uh, looks like, feels like, tastes like. You've done it all. You've seen it. Uh, so, like, even though you're in a slump, the second you see what you're dominant at or the second you get into a situation that you're familiar with where you're bowling really well, it's going to come back because yeah. that's, that's what happens when the, like, like look at Tiger Woods right now. He's uh he, he was so dominant for so many years and then he went away and now he's back to playing great golf. Well, why is he back to playing great golf? Because he understands how to play great golf. 
Like yeah. that doesn't go away. Even though he's had a lot of bad tournaments, even though he was away for four years or whatever, he still understands how to play great golf. And so if you're a guy like that's a bowler that understands, even if it's just playing right of five, if you, if you have this thing where you can bowl great, you know, that, that's, a, that's, that's important. Yep. Yeah. Because it, allow, it, it allows you to get out of your, so if you are on a slump, all it takes is that one time for yourself to see uh, what you're great at and then boom, slump over. Yep. Uh, but that's right. Like, like right. Francois has won before. Like I, I have no doubt in my mind that he's going to bowl really good. And it's not like he's, uh, I haven't really been watching him, but like I, I've heard, I heard him talk about being in a slump. I think he talked to me a little bit about it too out there. And, um, I think he just won a regional recently or something like that. Like he bowled really well. So it's not like, I mean, sometimes like we talk, go back to about sometimes you just don't have it and um, you're just gonna have to like let go and move on to the next one. And so, uh, you know, if he had a bad regional or he had a bad swing or whatever, he went on and won a regional or finished second in a regional. Like that's, I mean, regionals are still pro tour. So it's not like he's bowling bad. It's just, right. he's just not hitting it right now. And I, I don't think that's going to last forever. So, yeah. And, mm -hmm. He's obviously a very good bowler and has won before. So uh, it's just it's just a matter of getting your mind past it and just being like, okay. And, and this goes back to when we originally started this stream about staying focused and keeping your eye like forward, like when you're bowling bad and stuff like that. You gotta you gotta you know Joel and beat it. You gotta trust the process that Joel and beat it. <laughs> like what you like obviously what you did before worked, and so it's gonna work again. Or or we might have to change it up a little bit depending on how the game changes or whatever. But like. Uh, you've obviously done something right, so you're going to do something right again soon. Yeah, you'll see it again. So, as long as you just don't let yourself get too down in the dumps, you'll see it. You'll absolutely see it again. It's just yes. like the way it is. You got to trust the process. <laughs> um, what was I, what was I going to say? What was I going to say? Uh, I want well now. I want to talk about the NBA because now I'm kind of hooked on the NBA right now. But uh, <laughs> um, oh, so uh, Francois, we went to to Denver. There's two regionals back to back: one in Denver and then one in Colorado Springs. And so the Denver one, I've been to two years now, and Kyle, it was his first time. And Kyle's got this thing where he's really, really good at playing in, and then he's not so comfortable. He's still decent at playing right, but he's just not as comfortable. And I was telling him, like, you know, last year, this pattern, when you when you lay it back down and you get into match play, uh, playing right works. And it's a similar pattern to last year. And, and yeah. so this is what I saw last year. This is probably going to work. So in match play, uh, I try to play right. Kyle tried to play right. We both lost our match and Frankie won his. And I told Kyle, I'm like, Frankie's winning. Like there, there's just no, there's no body in this building that can beat him when playing right. Um, that's the one he won, right? Francois. Yeah. That's the was one it, Francois won was in, was in Colorado Springs this year. Was that the super regional or was that just a regular one? That was a super regional. Yeah. So he, he, he basically won a tour title almost at that yeah, point. Pretty much. Yeah. yeah. It wasn't the field of a tour stop, but uh, it was five thousand dollars. You know, it's, it's more than a regional, and so. and you can just you can just tell when he gets lined up that, I mean, it's just it becomes extremely difficult to beat him. Even if you post four eighty, four ninety on a difficult pattern, it, he's gonna find a way to shoot five zero just because he's comfortable, just because he's doing what he loves to do and he knows he's good at it. And even though there's times where he doesn't think he's very good, and he's in a slump. The second he sees that, it's game over. And yeah. you need that. You need, like if you're gonna bowl on tour, you have to have that, or else you're just gonna, you know, have a tough life. All right, so the NBA playoffs, dude. I I've been watching the NBA play. You're an NBA guy, right? Yeah. Man, I've been watching. I didn't watch much of the regular season, but I've been kind of hooked on the NBA playoffs. I think it's probably the most entertaining playoffs of any sport that I watch. Really? I'm kind of mad the Sixers laid an egg, <laughs> but um, Boston, man, they're going crazy right now. It's crazy about Boston is they're they're doing so well with without Kyrie without Gordon Hayward and I know um I like I'm a big Brad Stevens fan like I I hate Boston sports like I I hate every team in Boston I want them to lose every time but God you can't deny how good they are yeah. and Brad Stevens is a great coach and I it's just he just out, outsmarts the other team like he just knows what his guys have and takes advantage of that yeah listening to uh, was it Rozier? Rosie? How do you spell? How do you say his name? Uh, yeah, to, uh, Rosier or Ro yeah, I, know I, think, who you're talking about. I think it was him. He was talking in a press conference. And he was just like, you know, we're a team. Like 
you know, if there's a team that can win this thing this year, you know, I'm taking these guys over anybody. Like we, we work together, we understand each other, uh, we we play as a team. And then you look at a team like Cleveland, and they don't because, mm-hmm. you know, blame LeBron, don't le- blame, you know, blame LeBron. Uh, it's hard to play as a you know a sufficient team when he's you know feeling like he's got to take over. In order uh, to win, I guess. In, in hockey, too, uh, I don't know if you follow hockey at all, but uh, the Vegas Knights are making a run at the Stanley Cup, and this is their first year as an expansion team. And so uh, you, you were talking about being team and how they kind of just come together as a team versus a bunch of individuals or whatever playing for a contract. The Vegas Knights are kind of showcasing that now because since they were an expansion team, they all the players were kind of like, you know, a little bit like third, fourth string guys or whatever from other teams all put together to get on this new team. So they're kind of like a band of misfits and they were kind of written off to start the season. And then they just been on this tear all year long and they're playing really good. And I think they kind of attribute that to sort of them coming together and be like, Hey, you know, we were kind of written off. Let's come together and do this. And then, you know, they had their goalie behind them playing really well and they've just been killing it. I think that's just so cool to watch. So I heard that, I don't follow hockey much, but I heard that when since they were creating a team in Las Vegas, that every team had to lock down a certain amount of players, and then Las mm-hmm. Vegas got the pick from every team that from players from a player pool that didn't get locked down on their teams. Is that correct? Yeah, that's basically how it worked. Was yeah, every team could protect a certain amount of players. I don't I don't know the exact details, but I think it was you could protect a certain amount of players and your starting goalie. I think was the deal or whatever. And then, yeah, Vegas got to select uh, one player from each team, I think. And then they'd fill it up the rest through signings or draft or whatever. And who's the coach? Of Vegas? Yeah. Uh, I don't remember. So, like, a, like a, is he a, a new guy? Did he come from another team? Because obviously that's a lot of coaching. To be able to take a brand new group of guys that weren't even the best on their teams and make them play as a team, that's a lot of coaching. Yeah. Uh, the head coach of the Vegas Knights is Gerard Gallant. I don't, I don't know who he is. Hmm. Let's see That's, where he was coached I follow, before. I follow Daniel Negreanu on Twitter, and he was part of uh, – um, what was he a part of? He was a part of, like, that whole process of getting a team to Las Vegas, and he, was, he would tweet about it a lot and he would post pictures of – his uh, meetings that he was having with people and stuff like that. So it was kind of cool to watch from the very beginning of like a person that was kind of involved with building a team in Las Vegas. And then now they're just like killing it. It's yeah. kind of cool. That's good for me because uh, it's nice to see them do well. Cause they kind of Seattle's trying to get their hands on a team, both NBA and NHL. And they've just been in stupid political, like uh, swamp, for the last like five, six years about it. And they're finally starting to make some progress. So I think hopefully this Vegas Knights success kind of helps give them that push. Like, Hey, you know, we're not going to be terrible the first few years and it's going to be, you, you know, a joke, but it might are actually, you, are you dying for both? Do you want both? It'd be nice to have both. Like, <laughs> uh, I'm not like dying for it, but yeah, like it, I'm not a big baseball or football fan. And those are the only two, you know, major, uh, the big four, like, my two least favorites are the ones we have here in Seattle. So yeah, I, I like, I like watching hockey. I like watching basketball. So it'd be nice to get a local team for that. I'm not sure if I would ever go to a hockey game. If Kansas City ever hockey, I'd ever had a hockey team, but I would definitely go to NBA games. Oh, <laughs> did you see the, did you, I oh, mean, I think the NBA is so cool. Just, I, I don't know. I don't know what it is about it. There's just so much emotion that goes in. Like, if you if you look at the Cavaliers, they faced the Pacers the first round and they they won in seven barely. I mean the Pacers took every ounce out of yeah. you know Cleveland, and then the next round the, the Cleveland wins a four zero. It's like wow, but, but it's because of the Pacers game plan. They knew that they had to play physical. They knew that you know they may not be as great on paper stats wise, so that's why they just kind of beat the crap out of the Cavaliers. And then, you know, LeBron still comes through, which is a great story. And then they sweep, and then now they're getting beat by. I don't know. I just think the storylines are really good. Uh-huh. I think basketball is awesome. Do you see that JR push on in the JR Smith push against uh, what's his face from the Celtics? Uh, I caught the tail end of it. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. just saltiness. <laughs> Super saltiness. Yeah, like that's just like the only reason that happened was JR is just getting fed up with them having easy layups. <laughs> yeah. Like it, it had to have come from 
just J.R. Smith being tired of the Celtics making them look bad defensively. So he just said, screw it, and pushed him. <laughs> like, that's just like a game time, like, minute decision. Like, yeah. you know, you just, you realize that he's behind you, and then you just say, screw it, and push him. Like, he's in the air, and then, you know, almost into a fight. But I don't know. I just like that kind of stuff. Like, that's just instantaneous, like, emotion coming out. Um, do you, you bowled in college, so do you feel like watching the team sports, you kind of, like, you kind of know how these people are feeling in a way. Absolutely. Like the emotional swings and the, the frustrations and sort of like the, also the chemistry and how like sometimes like you threw a shot in college and you like willed it, you willed it to strike purely off of emotion or, or team chemistry versus actual shot making and stuff like that. Yeah. And yeah. it makes, it, I, I res- it makes you respect teams like Boston so much more. Um, because they don't have the star players they just they they work so hard as a team and they're having success and i mean i you you've experienced that either you've experienced it or you've watched it in college bowling is Uh teams that just aren't as good on paper or they're not supposed to be as good and they make the show in intercollegiate nationals and you're like and it's just them coming together it's just them believing i think it's them them believing yeah like that um or trusting the process and, and knowing that in a seven game match, like sticking to a game plan and, and not getting intimidated or being pushed around or whatever, like just doing your own thing. And that goes a long way, especially in a high, uh, high strung, high emotion environment. That is collegiate nationals. Like um, you get these every year, you get a team that kind of makes a run that you're like, wow, these guys, you know, you don't really know these guys, but they're doing something right. Or they're well coached or a combination of everything. And it's, it's really fun to watch, especially now that I'm not bowling college and nationals anymore. Like it's fun to watch from the outside and see these, these sort of misfit teams that make a run. Like every year you have a team coming out of sectionals that you don't really see throughout the year. And you're just like, what happened? You know, they yeah. just, they, they figure something out and they're going to make the run. A, a team like that, I think was my, maybe no, it was my junior year was uh, Fresno St- Fresno State and they had Greg Gearing. Uh-huh. I'm sure you're familiar with Greg Gearing living on the West Coast. Yeah. He wasn't anything fancy, uh, wasn't anything special um, looks-wise, but he kind of came out of left field and became a great bowler over like – became a great bowler over like a span of a couple of years. He made Junior Team USA or Team USA or something like that, and then he was the anchor for Fresno, and then he had this great year in college and – and they made the show one year and it was totally like just kind of threw everyone off like wow like and it actually ended up being a great team this fresno team was a great team they had gearing as anchor and then i don't know who else they had on the team but they had like four other decent bowlers and they just worked like didn't they win that year yes they won yeah. my yeah. they had i know they had travis uh travis beasley i think is his name mm-hmm. i remember that team you know. beasley uh yeah they won yeah. like it was it was awesome to watch. It was, man, to watch yeah to watch stuff like that is insane. And then you probably had like a Wichita State team with like all junior team USA members, and they mm-hmm. got like you know guys that haven't had that much success. Yep, that was my college career. <laughs> Did you guys ever make the show? Uh, yeah, we ended up winning the ITC in 2013, I think. Oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah, um, that was interesting year for me but i'm not gonna talk about that um okay talk about but, it come on well uh, maybe maybe for another day all i'm right. still a little bit salty but <laughs> that, that's just a personal business thing and right. i think i think most people if they really wanted to know they know but um all right yeah we always uh we had really good teams when i was there and you know we just it, it's just one of those things where we would get to nationals and we bowl well and then it would just we just lose it like we just get beat and uh i mean i don't i don't know like we i saw it has been three four years now i don't remember much but it's just like yeah we, we talked about these teams and it's not like these teams are full of nobodies obviously everyone there has game or whatever and it's just it's so itc is so hard to win because of that format and just like the intensity and the chemistry and it's just you, i can't even sit here and look in the past and be like, man, what could we have done different? Like we, we did our game plan. We, we thought we did what we need to do in and we got beat. So, um, yeah, that's, it happens so fast. 
yeah, it happens so fast. Like it's double elimination, but like all of a sudden you're like in game six and you're losing of your double elimination match. You're like, man, it's over. Like, yeah, crap. <laughs> you like that or do you dislike that? What the double elimination? Just like yeah, the the quickness of the you, know, you qualify and then you can be out in two rounds. It, no matter how good of a season you had, no matter how well you qualified, you know you can be out in the blink of an eye. Uh. I, I like that format personally. I, I like the double elimination. That's why I like the Masters so much too, because you can have a bad set or an offset or catch someone who's on fire and not be not have your tournament be over because of yeah. a matchup or whatever. And I like so the best of seven. I, I like too because it, it, if you go to seven games, and I think I've won a couple matches where we went to seven games, and I've been on both sides where we won and lost, and it's just like it's so emotionally high strung that like at the end of it, you're just like you're sweating, you're like. You can't like slow your heart rate down. It's just so much like craziness. It's fun, and I think if spectators too like that stuff too. But like when you're in it, you don't even think about the time or whatever. Like it could be two hours, it could be an hour, and you just kind of lose yourself in it. Especially since it's heads up. I love bowling heads up. So yeah, same. Do you have a do you have a favorite match that you bowled in college? Um, match. Uh, I don't know. I think. The matchups we had against other big name schools like Weber or Lindenwood or Wichita were always fun. Um, I do have a favorite tournament finish, I guess, and that would be uh, we won the Hoosier in my senior year, and that was probably like my favorite win out of everything. Yeah, even even more so than nationals and and all the we 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 won NAI a few years in a row. But winning the Hoosier, especially my senior year, was just so much like. It felt like a like because you know the Hoosier, the Hoosier's really tough and it's really, mm -hmm. it's basically a small nationals almost, and and the weekend itself is hard because you know you have to get up at five in the morning to bowl because the men always bowl in the morning, and so you you, know, you do all this traveling, you bowl hella early, you bowl all day, you're tired, and to just win, I think we won in seven games in that one too. Actually, I'm not sure, but I, the senior year, the culmination of basically the whole college career and all of us coming together and bowling so well and just we had like missed spares in the match and like we had all these ups and downs and we ended up pulling through and to get to sign my name on that uh masking unit and being up there for forever is just such a that was just so cool and we had such a like such a great group of guys that last year too it felt so right to win that tournament with them so that's probably that's probably my highlight yeah, that's awesome. I went to the Hoosier this year. I can't remember why. Oh, we were in the Indianapolis for the 60th anniversary, I think. Yeah, I went and caught the Hoosier, too. I caught one of the days. Dude, there's so many people. Yeah. Like, I just can't even comprehend how many people are in the bowling center during college events. Parents, bowling balls, kids, mm -hmm. coaches. It's like it's so packed. Yep. You can't see. It's pretty crazy. Yeah, we went and watched the uh... – the, I think we went and watched most of the match play because Army was in it, and like you could barely move. Like I know. It, Did you see your banner? What? Did you see your banner? The banner? Uh, I don't think I. I think I did. Yeah, it was yeah. somewhere down there. I'm sure. Cool. Yeah, I can't believe uh, Lindenwood women won this year. I guess I can't say I can't believe it, but <laughs> I mean, it's just it's hard to win, man. You could have the best team. You know, the best team you want, like, winning is still just incredibly difficult. It's like, hard then, to win. You no, know, I'm sure – I don't know their exact team, but I'm sure on paper McKendry was better. I'm just going to go ahead and assume. Yeah. Um, and they beat McKendry in the finals, like, on TV. That's – that's. I mean, I don't know. That's hard to do, man. That's good for the school. Yeah. Um, but I went to the I went to the Hoosier this year, and I saw the banner of the year we won. And the year we won – it was my senior year as well. And in practice, they laid out three different patterns for the qualifying. And then for the match play portion, because they take the top eight after qualifying, they laid out like a 40 foot flat. And yeah. man, that thing was hard. And in practice, I didn't, I didn't hit the pocket. I either went high or I was <laughs> walking out. And so I told Dan Limish, which was like my guy, I was like, dude, you got to go anchor. Like, I'm not going anchor. There's no way. <laughs> and uh, and he was one of those guys that was really comfortable in the four hole. Yeah. And, and I, it was kind of cool because I, I could trust, like, you know, the team, 
he knew he could trust himself in the four hole. The team was comfortable with it. He was comfortable with it. He was a phenomenal bowler. He could have bowled anchor a lot, but he was just comfortable there. And, uh, and so I told him, I was like, dude, you gotta go. This is your <laughs> moment. This is your glory. And he brought it home, man. He nutted up three <laughs> in the fifth frame and it was just like the coolest experience. It yeah. Was, it was awesome. I forgot. Um, Another reason why the, the that felt so good winning the Hoosier was because of how hard it was. And we bowled on, um, we bowled on, yeah, three different patterns. So you'd bowl on the, at least when when we did it, they'd do some super stupid like short and long for qualifying, and then yeah, you bowl on the flat pattern during the match play. And at Western, I I can't stand Western bowl personally, and <laughs> so like it's it's super hard to bowl on that in that center as it is so you put out the 40 foot flat and it topography yeah. and all that like it, it was hard so like your matches are 170 to 150 and you feel like you shot 230 or you're you're, <laughs> you're right. out of your minds <laughs> yep. so that, that that was another reason why i felt so good to win that tournament because it's just how hard the patterns are and just how stressful it is to win and the whole weekend so i know there was a my fresh my freshman year when we qualified for the team, I qualified like forty fifth. And Linwood Linwood had huge uh, amounts of people qualify. They probably had like you know, sixty guys qualify and maybe like fifty girls. They had a lot of people participate in their program. And for a while there, they took all of them. Everybody made a team, and we would take like two charter buses until USBC cracked down and said you can only have so many. <laughs> but anyway, so I was like forty fifth, and I I bowled horrible. I was started on the D team. And like throughout the year, I kind of like worked my way up and I, you know, bowl on the C team sometimes. And I bowl on the B T sometimes. And by the end of the year, I was bowling on the B team. And uh, Dean Richards and Tommy Smith were ineligible. So two spots opened up on the Nationals team. And, uh, and I got one of them. And so at Nationals at Cherry Lanes that year in Rockford, I was bowling just out of my mind. I, I went the first match I didn't miss. And then I was just bowling just, you know, the best I've bowled probably ever. And, and, and the last match we had was against Arizona state. And we tried to throw charcoal up the left side because we had, uh, did they, they had Andrew Kane? No, Andrew Kane's a little bit older than me. Uh, maybe they had Andrew Kane. They had a two handed lefty as well. I can't remember his name. They had like two, Cassidy. Uh, I don't think it was Cassidy. Was it? Uh, no, That's only two left yeah, yeah. They, they had like three lefties that were all pretty good and Haugen was coaching them and we threw a charcoal up the left side and Haugen made some comment like, thanks guys, we've been looking for hook all tournament. <laughs> so, <laughs> off, you know, because we made the wrong mistake and they, it did. We, we gave him hook. We gave him confidence for sure. And uh, <laughs> total backfire. <laughs> so, uh, I think it was a mixture between like Dole was anchoring Maybe council was anchoring. Some other guys are anchoring. Like no one was really bowling great. So then the we're down three to one, I think, or three to two, and they throw me an anchor. <laughs> and I'm like, all right. So then it gets to the point where and this is in the elimination bracket, and in the tenth frame, I need to I need to double, or maybe I need to, the first one or something. <laughs> in my freshman year, I go up there and I big four, and I turn around, and it's Dole's senior year and it's Council's senior year, and I turn around, and by the time I get off the approach, Dole's already crying, and I'm like, uh, <laughs> "Well, this is fun. Like, <laughs> I got more three. I got three more years of this, and <laughs> people's college career." Yep. <laughs> Thanks, coach. <laughs> yeah, that was brutal. But, um, right, so let's uh, let's talk PWA. I was gonna say, like, I got all these notes here. I did a lot of planning for this, so I'd like to. <laughs> touch so on it. I've been uh, so I've been following this, and I've been following the PWA because I really, really like what the PWA is doing. Have you seen the PWB on the road show that Emil Williams is doing? No. Okay. Well, when I'm going to be completely honest here. I have really not been following the PB, PWA besides just the updates I see on Facebook from people either bowling or from news news uh, press releases. Okay. Everything everything else I haven't really been watching. Well, USBC so. is doing this thing, this PWBA on the road show, um, where Emil Williams basically narrates the whole thing, and it's two parts. The first part is – well, it starts off with Emil, like, talking – to the camera or whatever and then jason thomas the video guy for usbc does a recap of last week and this is kind okay. of the this is kind of the beauty of having 
a, a, a week to week basis, you can do things like this. So Jason Thomas did a recap of last week and the recap included like some, some interviews from the players and how it went. And uh, they interviewed the defending champion, which I think might've been Rocio or maybe Rocio was the week coming up or, but they did like interviews with the players and you got to hear the girls talk about uh, their experience and so you, you got a full recap of the week before, and then it, it switched to Emil talking again. And then Emil sat down. This is the second episode. The Emil sat down with Josh Blanchard and Nathan Bohr, two ball reps on the PWBA tour. And he asked some questions about what's going on. Like, what, you know, what's your job like? What's it feel like? What do you have planned? What, what are you doing? How do you handle, how do you handle the women? Uh, what do you say to them? What's your game plan going forward for different personalities? Like, you yeah. know, what's in your name? Like he really dug deep into what Josh Blanchard and Nathan Bohr's game plan was. And I think that that kind of stuff is like the beautiful part of the game because Blanchard, Blanchard was talking about, you know, the scouting pairs and understanding which lanes are doing which and the characteristics of the lanes. And that way when their players go to them, they know, uh, what to tell them and they have an idea of what they're about to get into and if 21 hooks more than 22 and you know just like topography stuff and like all the strategy that goes involved or that goes into making the, the players make the show or helping the players make the show and I, I don't I don't think any of that stuff ever gets discussed no. it's kind of like this like hidden thing that happens on tour that no one really knows about is the ball reps and like the amount of effort that goes into you know, just making sure that you're bowling well. There's a lot of balls being drilled. There's a lot of scouting going on. Yep. There's a lot of just strategy talking. Like, there's just a lot of stuff going on. And Emil got it, got into it with Blanchard and Nathan. And I love both of their explanations. I think Blanchard's an incredibly smart guy, and Nathan's obviously an incredibly smart guy when it comes to bowling. And they, they talked really well about about the stuff that, that went on, and I loved it. I fell in love with it. I thought it was the greatest thing. So if you're listening, go to the USBC uh, YouTube page. And watch PWB on the show. So that's that's one thing I wanted to mention was I think the USBC is doing a really good job with a couple things. For one, they're doing that kind of stuff. They're getting like the nitty gritty, you know, grease from week to week stuff. And then they're also, you know, the formats of the tournaments are also really good. The the structure of the PWBA, like we were talking about before we went live, you know, they're consistent. You know, it's the same, it's the same format every week. It's the same, uh, you know, kind of group of girls. Some, you know, some girls don't bowl every week, but uh, it's 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 consistent. And when it's when it's consistent, it it provides people to be able to predict. And prediction is basically what runs sports nowadays, like fantasy and all that stuff. Like that's yeah. it's become a very big part of um, you know the success, or you know, just a big part of sports in general. Whereas, like, if you talk about the PBA, the PBA is sporadic, man. It's you have three events in February, then you're off for a month, and you have the PBA League, which is a totally different format, and then you're off for a month, and you get the extra frames, and then, like, it's just, it's all sporadic. It's almost impossible to predict who's going to bowl well in a tournament because there's always a month beforehand uh, that you don't know what's going to happen. You know, maybe Belmo's in a bad spot. Um, maybe he's not throwing it very well. Maybe something happened with his health and he broke something, or, you know, yeah. you, just, you just never, you, there's just, it's impossible to be able to predict. And so with the PWA, that's not true. You know, you can you know you can make predictions all day long, and that's one thing. That's why I've been following. They're born right now, yeah. Like, yeah, they're born right now, actually. Uh, and we're sitting here on on a podcast. <laughs> yeah. <exactly. laughs> uh, I've thought about doing something like that, where um, I don't know exactly how to do it. If if you can help me, if anyone can help me, that's listening, I want to be able to take my screen, so my shot right now on the camera. And just like minimize it down to like the corner, and uh, and then have like my computer screen on the rest of the screen, and then you know I can watch the telecast or something with people watching with me or something. Oh, like like a live, yeah, like a live chat or like a live discussion. Yeah, um, but I don't know. I don't know exactly how to get my screen to be small and then my computer screen to be up for a majority of the thing. But I don't know. But I've been thinking about doing something like that because I, I, I don't know. I think it's really cool. Um, I wanted to talk about something uh, that you brought up that I didn't even think about because uh, we talked before we went live about consistency and we were talking more so about scheduling. But yeah. uh, you just mentioned too about formats, and I didn't even think about this. But like, um, are the PWBA uh, tournaments are they all the same format besides exactly. the majors? Yeah, yeah. and um. 
you know, we joked earlier, I know at least I joked about it. I'm sure a lot of people did, but like how in February when we bowled those three stops, it was, it felt like we didn't even know the format until we started bowling because it either changed so much or because they're, they're all different and they were all different formats. Like one had match play or two of them had match play. One had 16 games of qualifying. Another one had like, like what, 18 or something like that. Another one. And then the one that didn't have match play, we bowled at 30 games, but we bowled five games. Like, I, spread everyone yeah everyone who was like messaging me from home or like they're like what are you what are you doing this week what's the format i'm like i don't know <laughs> i'm just gonna show up and bowl like until they tell me to stop at this point no one ever really knows I'm yeah not sure the pba knows the formats and like i feel like every extra frame event is different too like yeah, I, I, the, the main's the shootout and then yeah uh, the main set bracket uh sean rash's event starts on like a thursday or like, it ends on a monday or something like that i'm like what is going on here like i know <laughs> Like I'm trying to like like plan out like hotels and flights. I'm like, oh, it's Friday through Sunday. No, it's Thursday through Monday. No, it's Wednesday through third like next Sunday. Like what? I don't <laughs> I know. And then you have like I was just I just booked a flight for the Lucy and then the Lucy is the practice set. It's four different squads. So if you have D squad, you know, you don't technically need to be there until Saturday night. But practice yeah. sessions on Thursday. So do you want to get yeah. there on Thursday and then wait two days just to, you know, bowl your block, or do you just want to show up Saturday night, save Couple hundred bucks in hotel yeah. and hotels. the practice session. Yeah, I don't know. That's uh, that's format. Like, <laughs> so yeah, I, I know that's. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't. When we talked about consistency earlier, I didn't think about the formats. I wasn't even looking at that, and that that made a really good point. And um, well, the, the the formats for the PWBA events last year were uh, were a little different than they are th this year. Last year they did a thing where it, when they got to the 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 final 12 that they uh, they blocked them off into like sections of six and then the top two had to make it out or something like that. And then okay. so they went away from that. Now it's almost like total pins or it's um, maybe some match play bonus pins or something, but it's the same every tournament. And I, I think that's, I think that's really cool. And it's also cool to see. So the first, the first tournament Shane Ng won and then the next tournament Shane Ng made the show. And they run two totally different patterns. Yeah. The first week in Las Vegas, and this is the cool part about the, the PWB on the road show was Nathan Bohr talked about that. So they when they did that show, it was before the week started. And so Nathan Bohr was like, you know, last week the, the fronts were really glossy and, you know, these kind of balls worked. And then, you know, this week the, the fronts are not glossy. Uh, they're hooking a lot. And so that kind of brings out a totally different, you know, animal and, you know, strategy and all this stuff. And then Shane Ng still made the – telecast and it just makes it seem that much more impressive like you can go one week doing one thing for so many games and the very next week you turn around and have to do something completely different whole new mindset yep. like everything is totally different and you still make the show that's just really impressive the fact that it's back-to-back -back weeks yep and yeah you're exactly right and it shows like um how versatile these players are and like uh, going, yeah, from week to week, like you have to do something different this week. You have a whole different game plan, different um, ball ball choice, and uh, uh, you have to change your angles and do all that stuff right right away. <laughs> yeah, and really. and on the flip side of that too, um, with having the PWBA having all these events, because we were again we were talking about this before stream. If anyone's listening, and we were talking about the scheduling and how they're, I just had it up here on my other stream, but they basically bowl all of May and all of june right that's what we got and then they take like july off and then they have another month or so in august so like on, on the flip side of having to be like with shana making the two shows back to back like if you have a bad week or a weekend like you can it's so easy to like i don't know if it's easy because i've never experienced it but like you can let go and just move on to next week and be like oh i had a bad qualifying well guess what this term is over in four days i gotta start up all over again at the new spot new place so whatever and mm -hmm. Uh, compared to compared to the regular PBA tour, um, you, you, we don't have that, that. Like, I started to finally throw the ball really good at the TPC this this February. I bowled really well. My game was coming together. Like my my tour game was coming together, and then I bowled well, cashed the TPC. And guess what? That was it. Done. Like uh, as soon as and we talked about again about practicing how we can practice for tour. I don't have the tour game until I get out there and see what's actually happening. And it yeah. took me two tournaments to figure it out. And it's, it's hard to let go of a bad tournament or really like reset your mind when you only have this three or four week period to put it all together. 
Yeah. And so when I finally started putting it together, it was a TPC that was end of February, and that was it. I haven't bowled. I didn't bowl another PBA event until I bowled the Masters. So right. And yeah, and then you go out there and you just gotta make you gotta make changes on the fly because now what you practiced on, you know, isn't necessarily what you thought was going to do or work or whatever. And now you gotta start making changes on the fly. And if you're doing that, you're, I mean, it becomes extremely tough. Yeah, the uh, I I really like watching the PGA the golf uh, for because I like watching. I like watching it because they go through what bowlers go through as well. You know, the the daily struggles of like trying to get your game in shape. It's essentially the same game. There's a there's a pre shot, there's a shot, and there's a post shot, and you know you have proper thinking through it all, and uh, you know the best score wins, and you know it's essentially the same game uh, in that regard. So I kind of relate to what those golfers go through. Whereas, like, you know, they'll go a month with not knowing where their swing's at, and they'll go, you know, not make any cuts, and then they'll have a tournament where they finish second or they win or something. And um, I, I like watching those trends. I like looking out for those trends. I like to see who's playing well and who's not playing well and then try and guess who's going to play well the next week uh, given the course that they're playing. Yeah. So uh, that, that's kind of why I like to watch it. And you can do that with the PWA. You can see who's bowling well and who's not bowling well. I did a podcast of – a, like a two weeks ago, just on the PWBA, just on myself talking to a mic, essentially. And I, I picked my top five girls to look for mm -hmm. or to, to look after. The you know, people that when I look at standings, I notice I look for people. And uh, and the first one I, I the first person that I, I not necessarily look for, but the first person that I thought was going to have a decent year was Elise Bolton. Okay. Now. I thought Elise was is going to have a better year than last year because for one, she works hard. For two, um, she has a good mindset. So she had success when she was young on Junior Team USA, and she did some really good things. So she, she knows collegiately what's, too. what's that? She was good collegiately too. Yeah, yeah. Um, for Nebraska, yeah. And so she knows what it's like to to have like this kind of championship mindset. She knows what it's like to – kind of be at the top of a leaderboard, maybe not necessarily on tour, um, mm -hmm. but she seems like a girl to me that uh, believes that she can do it. And like, I just based on social media stuff and uh, seeing her every once in a while that I know she practices a lot and I know she works hard and she's worked hard on her swing for a while. And, and I've noticed that it's gotten a lot better. So it's things like that or to like, I can predict, like, I really think Elise Bolton's going to at least make a run at a show, if not maybe make a show or come close or something. So that gives me something to look forward to. Like, when I look at the standings, I have something to look forward to based on just a prediction that I have. Yeah. Whereas, like, if you're if you're looking at the PBA standings, like, it's, you know, you just, you just don't know. Yeah, and uh, with the PWBA, they, I have this, uh, again, I have the schedule up here, but it's like, they have how many stops? Ten or eleven? Yeah, I think. Uh, so, uh, here it is. One, two, three, four, 50. five, six, seven. Yeah. So, it's like, um, it like you said, it's just kind of easier to kind of be able to watch and predict and keep track because it is week after week after week. So it's like you're constantly fed information without like a break. So yeah. there isn't like a, a lag or, or lack of uh, communication or something like that. Or filler, I guess, if you want to call it that. It's actual mm -hmm. like stuff that's meaningful. And yeah. uh, I personally don't have predictions or whatever. Like, But um, it's just, it's yeah, it's just nice to see. I can go to the statistics here and see the earnings, the points, the average, the caches, and TV appearances. And it's just it's updated weekly in... Right on their website, it says 2018 player stats down at Nana McEwen, 28,500. Like, there's a list yep. right on the front page of the website. So you can see who's bowling well. You can see that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, okay, statistics, earnings, points, caches, average. That's – that's Aaron McCarthy has the highest average, but uh, isn't anywhere on – well, I guess maybe she only bowled one event. That could be true, or maybe a couple events. But I don't know. It just makes it interesting. It gives you something to look at. Yeah, it just it just feels organized because you don't you, you know what's a tour stop on the PBA PWBA tour. While even I'm confused, what's technically a tour stop or a world bowling tour event, but not a tour stop like on PBA because there's just so many different things going on. 
Right, and right on the PWBA tour statistics, you have the 2015, 2016, 2017, like right there, tabbed yeah. right there, and it just pulls right up. Yeah, dude, I'm, I'm definitely on the PWBA train. I think I think they're doing a lot of great things. I know maybe, you know, the women definitely have an advantage on social media. That is 100%. Like, I bet you a lot of those women are more valuable to bowling ball companies than guys are because the, just women just have it easier on social media. Like, huh. Daria can post a video of her throwing a bowling ball and it gets 500,000 views, you know. Yeah throws it sick and she looks good and then you know i, I you know chris barnes can post a video and it'll get five thousand. <laughs> yeah you know like, i I have, I have a lot of people come up to me and be like oh have you seen daria's video i'm like no like, like people are like like watching daria and i'm like okay <laughs> i know man they they have it so nice so i'm sure like in terms of social media they're they're even more valuable to companies than um than guys are but i didn't even think about that yeah um, um but yeah, dude, the, the the PWA is pretty sick. So my 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 top five. Let me let me know what you think about this top five. So my top five people that I think are going to do better this year than last year. My first one was Elise least bold. My second one was Ashley Galante. Are you in the Ashley Galante train or not? Yeah, I like I like Galante. Okay, my third one was also my third one's kind of sell out. But my third one was Verity Crawley, and I said Verity Crawley because she's on like the brink of like, you know labeling herself with like the McEwens and the O'Keefe's and the mm -hmm. Johnson's and the Zayalovas and the Rocio's like those great women bowlers. She had a good year last year and I predicted that she was going to have like an even better year this year and kind of put herself in that category of like, um, you know, all stars, I guess my fourth one was, and then so Verity led the, led the one tournament in Sonoma where the pattern was super hard. Did you watch it? So you, you haven't watched the show. No, so I haven't watched the show. The TV show in Sonoma County was, there was the, it was week three, I believe. Maybe it was week two. It was week two. Yeah. Week two. And the pattern was brutal. Like this is yeah. a pattern. They laid out a flat pattern last year and it was super low scoring. And they laid out a short pattern this year and it was super low scoring just because the topography of the lanes are just so bad. And, uh, and then so the final match, the final score was 268 to 266 O'Keefe. And uh, Verity had the front, front eight Damn. with two Brooklyns in there. And she was playing left, and O'Keefe was playing probably like five boards right of her with like more speed. But it was just a, it was a super sick match. O'Keefe is just amazing. I mean, so is Verity. And actually, yeah. talk, about, talk about nerves, man. Verity had the front eight. And in the ninth frame, she whiffed the head pin left and left the one two, the one three six. <laughs> so like that's how hard the pattern was. Like yeah. we had to, you know, there was a situation where a title was on the line. The pattern was extremely hard, and you know, it gets to people. Like yeah. shots like that happen when the stakes are super high. Like, you know, ten times out of ten, she's never gonna make that shot. But put yourself in the front eight on the hardest pattern they bowl on all year. For a title and O'Keefe's right on her tail. Yeah, you're gonna you're gonna yeah. keep it left more than you usually do. <laughs> and uh, that was that was I, you know I know that sucks for her, but I I enjoyed the fact that she missed the head pin left just because you never <laughs> you never see that. Like I think that's so cool. <laughs> and then she spared it, and then she needed a double in the tenth, and she um, threw pretty good and left kind of like a shaker seven for the loss. But O'Keefe, man, she needed a double in the tenth to lock her out or maybe the first one and plaque the ten, and she put it there. I mean, yeah. dude, I don't know, man. It was – I thought it was a good match. If it was on television and it was hyped up more, you know, if, like, you know, it wasn't just for $10,000, it was for $50,000 or something like that. If something – if everything about it was just higher stakes, then, you know, that, that could have been on ESPN or something. I don't know. Yeah top 10 or whatever. But I thought that term in particular was just sick to put you know, just the scenario, super hard pattern and you need a double on the 10th. That's what you dream of right there. You know, it's like when you want a double on the 10th, you know, it's, I, I guess it's nice to have them easy because it's, <laughs> easy to, but when you double on the 10th and you miss five left and it still strikes, you know, it's like, that's not really what you dreamed of. You dreamed of nutting those two for the cheese. Yeah. So yeah, but yeah, what else? Uh, what else you got on the PWA? Um, well, uh, I did a little a little research beforehand, and um, there's something that uh, kind of popped out to me was uh, the international presence on the PWBA tour is a little bit more 
uh, prevalent than say on the regular tour on the PBA tour because uh, I, I actually looked at these statistics before it was updated for Fountain Valley. So now I'm looking at them new from Fountain Valley. But uh, like just in the top ten or so, you you have it seems it feels like half the players in the top ten or fifteen are international players. And I went over and looked at the PBA tour uh, statistics, and it's not nearly as high a ratio. And I just I think that's kind of interesting to point out. Um, like I and again, like you were talking about social media and how the women are might be a little bit more valuable in a way, and maybe like people like um, seeing some of these women more because they are international. So they're, you don't know much about them or they're from an interesting country or something like that. Whereas on the PBA tour, like, Oh, EJ is from Indiana. Great. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Daria is from Poland. Shane is from Singapore. Like, it, like that's, that's pretty cool. Like it's, it's interesting. Like, these people are different and I yeah. think people kind of like that. Yeah, I definitely do. It's interesting to me that like Team Singapore, phenomenal bowlers, they come over as a team and they leave as a team. Yeah. Like they come compete on the PBBA tour, which actually they're only doing two events this year. They did the first two and then they're gone. Huh. Just are like, they bowling the, why? Are they bowling the Queens? Or I don't know. I think I, I was told they were only bowling the first two. I don't think they're bowling the Queens from what huh. I understood. They must Maybe have they some uh, Asian tour stuff because that stuff is way more important to them, actually. Oh they, yeah, dude! They make so much money. Yeah, for, yeah, for the, winning medals and stuff, and just for like their country too. Like they much rather have them win the Asian Games than they would PWBA stuff. Yeah, definitely. And so they uh, they came over for Singapore came over for the first two events, and then they leave, and then the next week the Indonesian girls come in, mm -hmm. which the Indonesian girls are also really good as well. So yeah, there's no Singapore women on the sheet right now. Yeah. They've got them updated after the uh, three games and a hundred overs leading. So they're not too they're not too easy and they're not too hard. So that's uh, pretty cool. Yeah. But yeah. So the Indonesian come, people come in, and so it's like the American women. It's like they dread the Singapore women, uh -huh. and the Singapore leaves, and the Indonesian people women come in. I've seen a couple of those Indonesian women bowl. Man, they throw it really good. I don't know yeah. how good they. I don't know if they're as good as Singapore, but you know they're pr pretty good. Yeah, the I see a lot of the international teams when I go bowl international stuff, and like they're they're good. Like that's simply put, like um, both the women and the men are just good players, and they take it very seriously over there. And it's no surprise that they're that good. And I'm not shocked at all when when uh, especially the like so you have like Diana and Daria and a couple other people from like Verity's from England, right? So you have the European players, like. I think they're a little bit different than the Southeastern Asia players, but they're all these international players are just really good. And it's no surprise to me when they, when they do win or do well. And some people might be like, Oh, I didn't know they're from here. Or I didn't, I never heard of this person. Like I've seen them bowl before because I've been around the world. So um, it, it, I wanted to just point out that the, the international presence on PWBA tour, because like, I, I want to know what attributes to that. Like what, why is, why does it feel like there's more international presence for the women? Like, is it, yeah. Do they have more opportunity to, um, like bowl pro stuff overseas and then come over here and have a better success versus like the women? I mean, I, I don't know. Um, obviously the, the Southeastern Asian teams, they have teams, they, they have training and oh, uh, they, they, get, they train get paid like to do this. Athletes. They train like Olympic athletes. Like yeah. that's what, that's as what they should, is. as we should. Yes. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, so that was the point I just wanted to get across was like, I think it's just something interesting to note that there's a big international presence. And I think that's really cool because uh, I'm a big fan of world bowling. And I think bowling's in a unique spot to where they can market it as like, they can have a world tour. Like we can have like winning in Qatar was so cool because I could say I'm a, like basically I'm a world champion. Like I'm an international champion. And I think, yeah. I think that sounds cooler than national champion personally. Yeah, exactly. You know? and, and it may not mean more, but it just sounds better. Like when I talk to people who aren't involved in bowling, they're like, oh, you know, what have you done? I'm like, well, I was best in the world for a week. Like I won an international, major international event. And if I just said I won a major national event, they'd be like, oh, that's cool, I guess. But like international adds a lot to it. Yeah. Like you won in Qatar. 
Yeah. Like, like I was sick when people hear that. Like, wait, what? You went to where? Yeah. I'm like, it's by Dubai. <laughs> 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 and uh, so, like, the international players coming over and bowling well, I, I'm perfectly okay with that. And because you can market it as like we're an international tour. Like, this is the best players in the world, not not just around the area. Like, I know. Imagine the PBA being like that to where like all the Americans got like you know, you know, they just didn't want anyone from a certain country like imagine like the singapore guys being like you know the sickest group of bowlers there is and they come over and just wax us like that's just yeah. isn't the case on the PBA, pba tour like other than belmo it's pretty much an american thing like and you have like dom barrett you have dom, is good. um which dom dom is amazing like yeah. it's it's, it amazes me anymore when someone is able to bowl that great one-handed i know that sounds weird but <laughs> That's the reality of the situation. If someone can bowl that great one-handed with their thumb in the ball, that's special. <laughs> I think about Dom is like, I feel like he's not really bowling that great, but he's like one of the best bowlers right now still. And I'm I, know, just like, he, I haven't really seen him bowl well, I feel like. <laughs> one in Japan. Like he just, yeah, I, I guess that's true, yeah. Here and there. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it's definitely not the case. You have, so you have, uh, well, I guess you got Jesper. Yeah, Jesper's good. Jesper, um, Dom... You got Belmo. I don't know. Yeah, I guess a lot of it, but it's Maybe. not like it's not like teams of countries are yeah. coming over here and just you know coming over here taking our money and leaving. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. I did. I I don't know, man. I I've been uh, I I heard I overheard uh, the a uh, Lavery Spar. I think it was Sean uh, talk about how they have a PWA fantasy draft. I think that'd be really interesting to do um with like you know some bowlers or make it public or get the public involved in it or something like that i think that'd be i think that'd be neat we uh because as far as the structure goes like the the uspc and the pwa are doing it the way it needs to be done so i'm going to do my best to give it as much love as possible and get as many people watching it because that's the structure that bowling needs is it needs consistency and it needs um you know storylines week in and week out Ah, storylines. That's a good one too. I yeah, think. like yeah. So okay, let's go down. Let's go down. And let's talk about some storylines. Okay, so Stephanie Johnson's in second round of the Masters. Stephanie Johnson. Okay, she had two kids. She came out of their fanny host thing. Great bowler. Didn't bowl very good the first week. Didn't bowl great the second week, and now she's sitting in second after three games of the Masters. She gonna make a run? Maybe. Brianna Cote, uh, great bowler, just signed with Storm. Um, you know. Maybe like she has a very old fashioned style. She doesn't have a powerful style. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and she led last week, so she's obviously bowling really good. And she's sitting, she's at six ninety three, so she's on a high. And then yeah. fourth place, you got Carolyn Dorn Ballard. Wow, Carolyn Dorn Ballard, like Hall of Famer. You know, Hall of Famer. You know, you know, just speaks for herself. Uh, you know, fifty something years of age, probably at this point. Uh, doesn't have a lot of rev rate. Shoots six eighty eight at the gate of the Masters. Or the Queens. Uh, fifth is Natalie Goodman. Okay, so a person that hasn't had a whole lot of success. She has success at Junior Team USA, but she hasn't had any success uh, on the PWA. She doesn't take it as seriously as a lot of girls. Uh, but so the she's six eighty five, and so maybe the left is kind of easy, or maybe she's just bowling unbelievably good. You know, yeah. who knows? Uh, Cassandra Luthold's in sixth. Uh, phenomenal player. She's probably one of those people that. Um, Maybe isn't bowling all the events, but definitely has what it takes to win. I don't know, man. There's just a lot. Like Missy Parkin just had a kid, you know, coming off. Yeah. Of, I read her blog. She's blogging. That was cool. She blogged about her entire experience at the second and she the second event, and she missed by three or four pens or something like that. The top twelve. And she blogged about it, and I read about it. It was cool. Oh, I should read about that. I should read that. Yeah, it's a good point. Like you just are going down the list here, and like you just say something about everyone, and like you didn't even mention like the people like we really don't know are international players. So you have a person from Mexico leading right now. You have a person from Brazil in seventh. Who is this person? <laughs> like it's just you're right. And then like guess what? You can do it all over again next week. Like yeah, <laughs> and yeah. you can carry on like their success from this. Like you were talking about. Uh, you said uh, Brianna, right? So like you can go into next week and say, man, Brianna's bowled really well the last two weeks. Like, what's she going to do this week? Or, you yeah. know, what's her game plan? How, is she going to change anything? Blah, blah, And that, that's so cool. That's really, that is interesting. That's fun. And, you know, sometimes we get lost in that on the, on the PBA tour because we just, uh, we we have a hard time because, I mean, we just don't really know much about these players. Like, us, like, we know each other, but, like, does the public know each other? Like, um, 
and it's we're so kind of sporadic scheduling that it's, it's hard to build up these storylines without sounding like recycled. Exactly, one hundred percent. And then you got you got uh, Bridget Popular, who's a popular, who's a girl from Germany, won the uh, Lucy last year with Sterner. Sterner yeah. Great player. You got Ashley Galante, who is, uh, you know, just kind of like a sleeper person. You got Claire Guerrero, mm -hmm. who's like this extremely successful person that rarely gets talked about. Like, she's not, like, I don't feel like she doesn't um, maybe have as much success or get talked about as much as, like, um, McEwen or O'Keefe or Stephanie Johnson or something like that. But then you got, so you got Claire Guerrero, who's very capable of winning absolutely anything. Mm -hmm. And then you got Sydney Brummett, who's like this up and comer, just graduated college, probably planning on bowling for a living or trying to on the PWA tour. How's she gonna do? You know, how's she yeah. gonna do? She just got picked for Team USA around a bunch of superstars. You know, that's probably got to be very good for her, her ego. So how's she gonna take it? Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. Jenny Wagner from Sweden, who just won the whatever international men's the Euro event. challenge Euro challenge. So how's she going to do? Is she actually like really good? Or is she better on like easier patterns? Is she like them hard? Like and she just won the, the masters too. that I went and bold. She won the EBT masters event. Where was that? That was in uh, Holland, the Netherlands. When did you go there? I went there a few days after the masters. It was, um, the end of April. Yeah. It was really? like it was like right after the main shootout. I didn't bowl the main shootout, but I went to bowl. I went to bowl the EBT Masters in the Netherlands instead. How'd you do? Uh, I finished fourth, I think. It was only eight players. It was only eight players. Yeah, so it was the. It was one day. It was eight. It was eight players. Um, it was just it was you know the top points on the EBT tour, and I got in because a bunch of people declined. So. <laughs> I went over and bowled. There's an EBT event that I bowled before, so were I kind of were you guaranteed money? Yeah, it was last last spot was 500 euro, and I ended up finishing fourth. So nice. that was nice. Yeah, that was like a thousand, I think, or something like that. So you so you basically got a free trip over to Holland. Uh, yeah, I got, I got really good airfare and just had to pay the hotel expense, and I only had to bowl one entry on the EBT event to make it, so I got cash there too. So. It was a it was a little frustrating trip because lanes were really soft and I like I thought I bowled better than I you know yeah I don't know I thought I could have won but I, of course I have to think I'm gonna win but right um, it it was nice to go over there and bowl and compete in something again and I'd much rather go over there and compete than in Maine to be honest did did, did, did Jenny yeah dude yeah the Maine, Maine is Maine is amazing in a lot of ways but oh yeah I don't doubt that but um for for me like. If I'm going to travel, one, it's expensive for me to get to pretty much some of these parts of the country from Seattle. And um, two, the main, I, I wasn't picked for any of the teams. So I didn't really have, the yeah. only reason I go up to Maine is to bowl the main shootout. And mm. I didn't want to, I just didn't want to do it. Like, I just didn't feel like it was, it didn't, it wasn't um, beneficial to me to go bowl that. And I feel bad because it's a PBA event, but at the same time, I got to think about what's best for me. Oh, yeah, for sure. And you know every every term is an investment, and if I don't feel like it's a good investment, I'm not going to invest. Like it's just the way it is. Yeah, going out there to pay five hundred dollars. I know you only have to win one match to to make a thousand bucks, but you know that's five hundred dollar entry fee plus your airfare. That's potentially like a nine hundred dollar trip for two games. That's airfare, hotel, uh, rental car, depending on like if yeah. I get one or not. And um, again, I wasn't picked for a team, so I'd only go up there for the one day event, pretty much. And right. Like I. I when else am I, I? I don't know. I just every year I get I get asked if I'm going. I'm like I just can't do it. Like yeah, definitely. No, I think you made the, the correct decision there. Yeah. So she won. So she won that uh, that Masters event. Yeah. Is she getting handicapped? Uh, it was well. Um, well, it was a women's event. So it was women's and men's like separate categories. So I mean, they all would have got oh, equals. So she won the women's side. You won the yeah. Men's she side. she won the women's side. Sorry, yeah. There was yeah. a women's and men's side. Yeah. Okay. But, well, uh, yeah, because they get you know Jenny Wagner won um, uh, the, whatever, the Euro challenge, the Euro challenge, and she was With getting eight pins yeah. a game or eight pins a game or whatever. Eight pins a game, yeah. Okay, so if she can go do that and beat Anthony Simonson, mm -hmm. and then say say she goes out on the PWA tour and never makes a show, I'm not saying that's going to happen, but I'm saying if that happens. Then I think it's pretty obvious that maybe like the eight pins a game thing isn't 
isn't correct. You know, like so that maybe there's a storyline there. Um, well, uh, uh, yeah, the eight pins a game thing is kind of. I was okay with it when I first started bowling these international events. To that, one because I never saw it before, so I thought it was kind of a cool idea. And but now, like, women are so good. Like, I, I just. I think the Euro Challenge is kind of going to be the thing that kind of pushes the world to kind of get away from this handicap or lower it or something. Because I, mean, I get my ass kicked by a bunch of these women all the time. I get my ass kicked by yeah. everyone. So, <laughs> um, they're definitely, like they're definitely good enough to you know take a hard pattern and to average two fifteen on it or something like that. And if you give them eight pins a game, that's an extra fifty six. That's a lot of pins, man. And I know, I know, like the men are you know technically supposed to be better or whatever, but these yeah. girls are good. I would like in the PWB on the road show they did like a you know the recap thing of Ayalova want or led the first week, and they they showed a lot of shots of her. Man, her release is sick. Yeah. It is a sick release, and there's no reason why she can't keep up with anyone. Given the reason she can't keep up with people on the PBA tour is just a power aspect. There's yeah. so many, there's so many, uh, like the transition is just so brutal because there's so much rev rate. But if you put her on a pattern where you know the power aspect isn't necessarily a thing, like the Masters pattern or something, or something that involves accuracy or a short pattern or just something she matches up on, she can absolutely beat anyone in the world. Like she's good enough to do it. You can tell I, definitely by a release, and she goes over there and matches up, and you give her eight pins. Good luck. I think uh, I'm gonna expand on it a little bit. Like you talked about on tougher pattern, is they're probably a little bit more evenly matched. I think on a softer pattern, they're evenly matched too. Like, yeah, um, we bowled. Uh, I remember when I first bowled the Amir Cup, which was in Qatar as well, but it was a different tournament. It wasn't Qatar Open, and it was on a soft pattern. It was. And we bowled two eight game blocks, and the women got eight pins a game. So they were getting sixty four pins a block. So for qualifying, they had an extra one hundred and twenty eight pins, and they were already averaging two thirty on top of that. So like they were basically averaging two forty. So that means I had to average two forty. Exactly. And like uh, if people are like, oh, I wonder, like Council just said in the chat on YouTube, like they've closed the gap on a lot of patterns, especially the tough patterns. I think the gap is closed. Period. Like I, I think it's closed. Period. I think yeah, the, ball, the balls are too move. strong. The like the lane patterns are are what it is, and um, it's not a, a woman versus man thing. Like we're all really good. So like, I think it, the eight pins a game is either gotta be lowered or just taken out of the world bowling stuff. And if they take it, they don't get the title, which counts, but they still get the prize money and and the title right. and, and the title itself. So I, I don't know. I, I feel like yeah, because the PBA is not on board with the eight pins a game. They don't. Yeah. They don't, so they right. don't. TV title if they choose to do it. Yeah, and um, again, at first, when I first started bowling international events, I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. Like, it might might drive up entries. It might make it a little bit more parity. It might have a little bit more diversity in the field. But now I'm just like, ah, here we go. Like, eight pins a game. Like, it's, yeah. It's I, think I, was, I think I was pretty cool with it. I, I know McEwen won an event one year that I thought, uh, I thought was great. Like, yeah, she's a great bowler. She definitely deserves to win. Um, you know, she was given the eight pins, which is cool and all. And then I, I think like a couple months later or something, there was another event where uh, the top three were lefties and Diana won, or the top three were women mm -hmm. and uh, and Diana won. And the top three were women. And I'm like, uh, I don't know about all that. Like, you're telling me there's all these great guys in the field and the top three are women. So I think uh, when Marshall and I bowled the ball master back in 2006, 17 so it would have been last year january it was the first term of the year for us and i think the top step ladder like the pattern was soft there too and the pad the top four i think three of them were women or whatever and it's just like you know um there were obviously more men in the field than women so like some there's some sort of advantage there and um over a lot of games that handicap adds up because that's that one hit a game they're right. they're you know they're, they're being given the extra hit a game Basically, eight pins is about a little bit less than one hit a game. So, yeah, and if you look at a girl like Daria, you know that that power aspect. She has more revs than I do. I know she has. Right. She had the front ten on the double burn squad the very last game. The very last game of the double burn squad at the Masters. She had the front ten lofting the left gutter cap. Yeah. So it's okay. What can they really do? What can we do that they can't anymore? Yeah. Like so. they're, they're training to be able to do the exact same things we can. So. But that, I think that's something that the World Bowling is looking at, is I keep hearing. So we'll see where that goes. But, um, 
you know, a couple of years ago, I was all for the A pins, and now I'm all for getting rid of them and just yeah, like, make, make it scratch. Like, it's we're we're world bowlers, we're world class bowlers. Let's let's you know, fair and square. Let's let's go out there and compete. Right. Yeah. Especially. Yeah. Definitely. 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 Well, man. You want to answer some uh, chat questions? <laughs> yeah. Let's do it. You have any from the Facebook post from yesterday? That was, there was some hate going on. Maybe we can. Oh, to that. dude! You know what's funny is, uh, um, Barnes got on there. So I posted a status a while back, and uh, um, oh, what was I? What was I gonna say? So I posted a status a while back about something, and Pfeiffer got on there and trolled. I can't remember who he trolled. He might. Oh, he trolled Barnes. And okay. I can't remember what I, the status was about, but he trolled Barnes and Barnes got on there and he said something and Pfeiffer was like, I just learned from you, buddy. Talking about uh, Pfeiffer learning trolling from Barnes. I didn't even know like Barnes. I, you know, I, I'm not on social media a whole lot or Facebook. Yeah. Whole lot. So I didn't really know Barnes's interaction with Facebook or people or whatever. And then so I posted that status yesterday and he definitely trolled. Like Barnes is a troll, man. <laughs> <laughs> a little sneaky one. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let's see what he said. Hold on. Do you uh, do you remember anything that was said? Okay. Tim well, was like Dean Richards. Please discuss Dean Richards. <laughs> pass. Yeah. So Barnes is like, how is charisma <laughs> and over the top enthusiasm have has contributed to a success? <laughs> 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 over the top enthusiasm. Yeah, because uh, when you posted that status, it, it sounds like you were kind of having a like a Q and A with me, and I, I looked at it as more of a discussion, and I think yeah. people kind of took it as like questions for me. I was like, mm -hmm. I, I think you meant more for like us. Yeah, <laughs> but it, it, it was kind of funny. Yeah, um, I saw that Barnes comment. So <laughs> I, I saw it, and and Barnes says how his charisma over top enthusiasm has contributed to success. So right below that, Dred Thompson asks the mental game, Cameron, how do you block out so many haters? What's your secret to success? And I was gonna say my charisma and over the top enthusiasm, <laughs> <laughs> but I never got around to posting it. <laughs> but I thought that would have been pretty funny. Oh, that would have been great, dude. That would have been great. All right. Uh, I want to answer. I actually want to answer some of these. So, uh, morning rituals before qualifying. We'll start with number one from Patrick Martinez. Uh, I people know me. I always go grab coffee. Uh, I need the coffee or else I can't function. I can't think without coffee. Like, You're a caffeine guy. Yeah, I'm drug addict. Um, and I like my coffee because it calms me down a little bit. It gets me kind of ready to face the day. And you want to have good breakfast too. Like, yeah, nothing, nothing too filling. I don't go out and eat pancakes or waffles. I usually have like a nice little uh, wrap or sandwich or breakfast burrito and call it good. Hey, I kind of um, wanted to talk about that a little bit. Um, your diet. So you don't eat meat anymore, do you? I'm vegetarian. So that's no meat. No oh. meat. And mm -hmm. you feel a lot better? Yeah. Um, uh, I originally did it as sort of a mental exercise to see if I could actually do it and put my mind to something. And then I felt good. Um, my health seems to have improved or, or whatever. I've lost weight uh, indirectly from it because it's just kept me off of um, eating crap, like yeah. fast food. So I don't like, stop at Taco Bell or Jack in the Box on my way home from Lee anymore. Um, I just, yeah, I have no reason to stop. I don't crave meat or anything like that. And I get all my, I, I like what I do and it's nice. So. Yeah. That is cool that you found something that you like. I feel like I'm kind of the opposite. I feel like all I ever do is eat meat or I eat <laughs> meat and you know, every meal. Uh, it, it does get a little bit hard when traveling. Like it was a little bit hard in Holland actually, because, um, it's just the options are are kind of limited when you travel because you don't have the option to kind of cook on your own and go out to the grocery store. So in in the bowling center, I ate like the same thing every day, and it was the one thing that didn't have meat on it, and it was sandwiched with like cheese and some cucumbers or whatever. Right. <laughs> so like sometimes I have problems when traveling, but for the most part, it's really not that hard. It it's just I just go to restaurants and if I see something, I just ask for it without meat. Or whatever, and I just say, make sure there's no meat in here, or throw a couple extra veggies in there, or something like that. It's all good. Well, cool. So yeah, so you uh, you eat, you get your coffee. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, that's pretty much all in the morning. I just I try to get up like earlier. I want to like have time to wake up. I don't want to be rushing out the door or anything like that. So I, I try always try to give myself time to 
wake up and get my shower and take my time and because uh this isn't college anymore like i don't want to have to like yeah, spend i was gonna say that i used to be able to do it in college a lot just wake up and like get dressed and go to the bowling alley and bowl and nope. now it's like if i do that i can't i'm not functioning the way i should be functioning i need uh, like an hour of like waking up and you know maybe doing a little bit of like a uh, agility training yeah. maybe some like push-ups or just something to like get me going i need like some time just to actually wake up yeah and i like getting to the bowling center i was never a big fan of getting to the bowling center early but I, I like to get there early especially on tour and stuff because like if something happens or i need to take care of something i want to be sure i have time to do that so i'm not running around rushing through the paddock grabbing my stuff right making sure i have my tape ready and all this stuff like I want to get it relaxed and, uh, you know, and plus like getting there early and walking around kind of is that agility or aerobic training in the morning, kind of just loosen up your body a little bit and just trying to right. get a feel for the environment instead of rolling out of bed hungover or whatever, just going to the bowling center. Like, I just don't want to do that. <laughs> yeah. I'm kind of the same. That's, that's pretty much my rituals. I just, I just try and wake up early enough just to be able just to be awake. Yeah. Um, but I've been doing this kind of thing. I've been reading a lot on uh, fasting and doing some like kind of intermittent fasting stuff. And I do feel pretty good in the morning when I don't eat. I was really skeptical about it because I used to think, like, I don't eat, I'm not going to have any energy. And uh, I started like not eating in the mornings. And then I started going to the gym on no, nothing, no calories. And I was still performing pretty well. And then I got to be like feeling pretty good about it. And then I bowled an eight game block one time on no food in the morning. So I've been kind of like messing around with that as well, like not eating in the mornings just to like have this fasting period. I don't know if it's, I don't know if it makes me feel better or worse. I kind of enjoy it to be honest. And they say yeah. that a little bit of fasting is, is decent for you. Our bodies are naturally kind of prone to it. Yeah. I mean, if it feels good, then. Yeah, it does. Yeah. What else we got? Uh, Transition from college to PBA, that could be like a whole nother podcast, but yeah. Yeah. I touched on that, like about how yeah. it's just different, like it's just faster, intense, just fast. Yeah. I, I like to use faster, it's, everything's faster, everything's quicker and faster. Yeah. I think that's true in any sport, like we were talking about basketball earlier, like the game is just different, like it's faster and bigger and stronger. <laughs> yes, exactly. Everything, everything's just more magnified. The the moves are more magnified. Mm -hmm. The scores are more magnified. The intensity is more magnified. Yep. Um, um, new rule changes for bowling balls. I don't want to talk about that. <laughs> so uh, Kevin Voster is like favorite foods, and he's like steak. Oh, never mind on that one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you stay at his house when you go out to Chicago. Uh, I think yeah, I'm staying out there when I'm going out there to bowl Sean Rash's event. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah. I'm looking forward to Sean Rash's event. Are you golfing beforehand? I don't golf. <laughs> yeah. uh, I mean, I'm not great at golf either, but I think it'd be pretty cool. And if, you know, stuff like that. Like, I think Rash does a really good job. You know, say what you want about Rash, but I think he's, you know, he does a great job with the, uh, uh, with his event. Last year, I th or two years ago, I swear he had an event last year, but two years yeah. ago, um, I, you know, I, I thought it was the best event we bowled, to be honest. Yeah, I when I bowled at his event two years ago, I was like, "This is great!" Like, uh, Sean, Sean is a player, and he's a current player too. So, like, he knows what we want as players and what we kind of expect out of the event, and how to host an event. So, yeah, uh, I messaged him last year sometime. I was like, "Hey, when's your event this year?" And he said he wasn't running one. I was like, "What?" Like, you know, I was, I was like, really looking forward to this because, uh, yeah, not only is his event good, but it's in Chicago land area, and you know, it, it's easy to get to for me especially, and I know a lot of people in that area, and. Uh, I'm looking forward to this year. Like you're right. Like he, he knows how to put on an event. He, he really builds it up and I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah. There's a, there's a golfing outing with all the sponsors and the players who want to do it before the practice session. Then we go to the practice session. And I think that night there's a live band and a barbecue. Yeah. We wake up the next day, we bowl. And I think there's something that night as well. And then there's a pro-am in there and there's a, I think there's a youth clinic he wants to put on as well, and just, just it's a whole it's a natural event versus like a weekend thing. Like it's it's, it's exactly. all. The one thing I really liked when I a couple years ago is he personally handed out the checks too, and he shook your hand for coming. Mm. And he said thank you for coming, and he handed, gave you your check. I thought that was really cool as well. Yeah, just the little things. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Definitely. That just you know you don't always you know sometimes you do, but you don't always experience. Uh, I'm a little salty 
and I mentioned this uh, way earlier, I think before we went live, about how it's on, it finishes on a Monday, technically, I think finals is on a Monday. And I'm just slightly salty because I got to go bowl nationals the next Tuesday, that that Tuesday, I mean, right after that. Right so I'm try- uh, I got to figure out how to get from Chicago to Syracuse Dang. on Monday night, and I don't want to drive, and flights are kind of expensive. And I think the one person that I would drive with, he's probably not going to wait for me. But that's, I mean, I don't plan on making the finals, so maybe I'll get out of it. <laughs> right. So, whatever. Yeah, that's tough, man. I'll live. <laughs> yep. All right. Uh, that's about it. I mean, we had yeah, some. Man, let's uh, let's wrap it up. I got a yeah. uh, I got a lesson at three fifteen. It's about a forty minute drive. So oh shit, man, I get out of here. For me to head out. So thank you uh, for doing this, man. This is really cool. Hopefully, we can do it again. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Uh, it was yeah, fun I talking. I definitely want this to become a thing. Hopefully, the people listening enjoyed it. Uh, if there's anything that um, you know you guys like to hear or talk about or whatever that involves bowling in general, I think. Uh, either me or Kyle or our friends or Cameron or whoever, uh, you know, can definitely, you know, speak uh, about it in a somewhat knowledgeable way. So, yeah. Yeah. It's definitely cool. Thanks, man. Um, I'll get this uploaded to the channel. And yeah, first one ever. So, gotcha. All right, man. Well, I'll, uh, I'll see you later. Thanks again, Brad. All right. Yeah. Bye.